All right, guys, welcome back to the Seek One podcast. Um, we are going to get a lot more consistent with these as the season is getting kicked underway. It's the end of July right now, and we're going to be doing these more regular. We've got a really interesting conversation that I'm personally really curious to hear a lot more about. So we've got Bill with us, which you guys are super familiar with, Bill and Spartan Forge. We've got Steve Ditchkoff with us, who is a – you want to give a quick – background on who you are real quick um, i'm a professor here at auburn university in the wildlife program um been here for 22 years and uh primary deer researcher been doing deer research here for 22 years and got to know bill about six seven years ago awesome so i think there's a lot to unpack here a lot of information that i know drew and i we have a lot of questions for you um you also y'all actually also have a previous relationship because y'all were <laughs> You took one of his classes, two of his classes, right? I guess one. My, uh, we don't, so we only have three headsets here, so Lee and I are going to pass them back and forth a little bit. <laughs> uh, yeah, I took, what was the course called again? I thought it was like a, a wildlife and food plot. Yeah, it was a food plot management. So yeah, I showed up and first thing I said was, I think I got a 98 in your class and he pulled up my grade and it was like an 87, so <laughs> not off to a good start, but... Rose-colored yep. glasses. First, yep. Uh, just always remember that, that, that deer to be a little bit bigger than it actually was. <laughs> <laughs> but what I did say was that compared to my grades in engineering, which I was in for three years, it felt like a 98. So I'll take the 87. I appreciate the grade. Now, something I didn't tell you ahead of time, and I hope this is okay. I went to Alabama. Roll uh-huh. Tide. Hey, it wouldn't be fun, any fun if we all rooted for the same team. <laughs> I was actually going to start this podcast off with a question that I think now – being here i think would be in very sour taste if i asked if if i asked it jokingly so i'm not going to ask it jokingly i'm going to try and ask it respectfully because i'm genuinely curious i i was going to make a joke about hey hey how's your trees doing i'm not going to do that because i feel like it would upset you uh i am genuinely curious though like i didn't what happened with that I, I, did they remove the tree? I mean, I'm the, the, the trees are gone. Um, or the original trees died. There, there was no saving those. I mean, they did everything they could. They dug out all the dirt. They, they bathed the roots. Um, that, 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 that toxin that that individual used is foresters don't use it. Yeah, it is just it, it's deadly. Um, they've replanted trees there, um, and those are actually descendants of the original. No, 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 I'm sorry. Those two are not, but the, the lining, the sidewalk there are actual descendants of that original oak. Um, for years prior to that, we had actually been, the School of Forestry and Wildlife Sciences, a single a professor there had actually been working with the Wildlife Club and the, the Student Wildlife Society and, and the Forestry Club to pick acorns and grow tumors oak seedlings. Um, they'd been selling them for $50 a piece really? as a um, fundraiser for scholarships. So while the, the, the second layer of story that nobody's aware of is they know what, what happened to the tree and they know it was poisoned, what they don't realize is there was tens to hundreds of thousands of dollars in future scholarships lost for forestry and wildlife students. Wow. That's the part that nobody knows about. Um, yeah, and that's, that's terrible. It, that, that was really unfortunate. And so, you know, it is what it is. It's, you know, it's water under the bridge now, but. It was unfortunate for those future students. And that's why I didn't want to bring it up in a, a joking way. But no, I, I no. was curious, like, now that it's down the road, kind of what's happened since. And, and for those of y'all that don't know, an outlandish Alabama fan poison. So Tumors Corner is famous in Auburn. Typical Alabama fan. <laughs> he didn't go to Alabama, so we don't claim him. But uh, it's tradition here in Auburn that after after a win, right, that y'all rolled the trees in Tumor's Corner with toilet paper. Yeah, it's 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 pretty strong tradition, tradition, and it's and it was very emotional for a lot of people because it's it's important to them to pass on to their children is going to going up to Tumor's Corner and throwing toilet paper rolls over rolling Tumor's oaks, um, you know, at after a big win, and yeah. so that was it, it. It negatively impacted a lot of people. It's but it 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 also speaks to the the depth of the rivalry. Yeah. Um, you know, in this state. Well, it's taken too far. So basically an outlandish Alabama fan came and poisoned those trees, which has been a long standing tradition here at Auburn and it was just He didn't even go to Alabama. No, he didn't even go to Alabama. He just showed up. Yeah. So it it was sad. It was not I mean it was obviously taken like way too far, but uh I was gonna make a joke, but I was genuinely curious like down the road, like how if you could even plant trees there again with what all he put in the soil and things like that. So yep. I'm glad the, to hear that. Yeah, they're, they're planted. Um, they're, they're not as big. Um, you know, you just can't bring in trees that big, and it's going to take a couple decades for them to get that size. But, yeah. I mean, the, the tradition's still going on, and the tree's Good. down there, and so the tradition hasn't ended. Good. Yeah. Um, well, 
moving past that, I want to, uh, and Drew and I are both genuinely super curious about this because we met Bill and got on board with uh, Spartan Forge and, and kind of what he created with a lot of your intel and, and your research. We kind of saw the after effect. We never really saw kind of how y'all came to be or how those early conversations kind of happened and, and y'all's relationship. Uh, I, so that's what I'm genuinely curious to, is to kind of take it back to the beginnings of what, you know, with Spartan Forge and what came to be in all the research that kind of came poured into it. And uh, we were kind of joking earlier, Bill, about how the, I guess you initiated the, the conversation of like, Hey, yeah, just can cold. I get some research? <laughs> I was just cold calling academics at that point. I had just returned, or maybe I was just going to, I can't remember at this point. It's 2015. I think I was just returning from Afghanistan. And I had assisted on building some predictive technologies for the U.S. military um, that we were testing and using out in Afghanistan. <clears throat> and it occurred to, well, it actually occurred to me a couple of deployments earlier. The thought came to my mind, um, this could be useful in deer hunting. Like doing something like this, if you had what, what we like to call an, uh, well, an artificial intelligence truth data, which is essentially data that's as void of bias as possible. If you, you know, train any type of predictive technology, neural network or anything like that with um, data that inherently has bias, then you're going to have a biased model. So when I was training models in the military or supervising the training of models in, in the military, and using those things for military operations, our work was always, how do we remove as much bias from the data as possible? So I started thinking about, in the context of deer and being a hunter, I was a bow hunter at the time, uh, how could I take, what data sources could I use to train a model? So before I talked to Steve, a very long story short, and I'm covering about three years, I'd kind of built out my own sensor network using like accelerometers and using weather vanes and using uh, wireless cameras. I was I'd basically wired up a farm that I had access to and started training my own data. <clears throat> and what I was getting from that data, the, the data was flawed because, and, and Steve can probably talk to this better than I can, but I only knew to put a camera up or I only knew to put an accelerometer in a scrape in areas where they knew there were rubs or scrapes. So in other words, if I were training a model based on that data, the, 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 the property, it turned out uh, two years later, I found an area that had far more, far many more scrapes in the area and rubs that I totally missed out on for about two years of collecting data. So my network, there could have been daylight activity all day long on this part of the property that I would never knew about it. And my model would know nothing about it. So what I started doing was just in true warrant officer military fashion, just cold calling academics and saying, hey, I'm trying to build something. I think the best source of data for this would be GPS collar deer data. Would you be willing to share some of this data? And I, I basically got, you know, three responses from academics, researchers that I was reaching out to. And sometimes I'd reach out to um, people that were managing lands as well that had paid a university or, or, or co cooperated with the university, and they would give me the data as well. But most of the data came from academics and online repositories. But when I would engage academics, the general response, there were three. One was, you know, I've moved on from that. Go ahead. Here's the data. Take it. Do whatever you like with it. The second one would be, um, <clears throat> you know, I can look into that or I'd have to talk to the people who funded the study or I'd have to do X, Y, or Z. There are more constraints on the data or their ability to share it because of how it was funded. And then the third response, which I think was more characteristic of Steve's response was, why would I share my, wife, my life's work with you? Are you out of your mind? Um, and it was amusing because I was kind of collecting emails back from academics and researchers that were, you know, that spanned that. So I think my first two or three emails back from Steve were like, you're insane. No, I've, this is my life's work. I'm not going to just deliver it to you. And he's right. And that's, that's the right, that's probably the right response because what it led to was me re-engaging him and saying, well, here, I think I told you about some of the stuff I'd done with the accelerometers and other stuff I was doing on these properties and sharing that data. And then maybe Steve, I don't know, I won't speak for Steve, but he probably scratched his head and said, oh, this guy's not as you know, off his rocker as I thought. And then we just talked, I think, for a while, actually, I think for maybe four or five months and just shared, talked back and forth. And then that eventually led into the, some of the first sharing of deer data, called GPS deer data, which we were able to train some of the earliest models with. 
and we're again, and I'm going to try to keep this at, at a nice and high level that will, everyone will understand. But essentially, one of the ways to test whether or not an artificial intelligence model is predicting data correctly is to test it with data that it hasn't been trained with, and then to make sure that there's something called recall, where essentially the, the accuracy can be measured based on deer data that the model hasn't seen before. So Steve might share me share some data with me from a study that was done over three years in Auburn, and then he might have a friend of his who has some deer data from Texas or some deer data from Mississippi or something. Then I can train a model based on that one set of data. Then I can take the other two sets of data, and I can actually look at what the deer did over a certain period. And test them out. And test them out and say, was this thing accurate or not? So we started getting accuracy, I think, very early on. That was north of 50% across six buckets. So across six possible answers um, uh, concerning what the model does today, which is movement and pattern. We were starting to get into the 50s. And then we, as we added more and more data, um, we're at about 66% accuracy. And there's, uh, there's some diminishing returns as you give more and more data to a model. It only gets so much better. So, you know, we've now added data from, you know, Saskatchewan, Manitoba, the Dakotas, um, we're looking to get some right now in, Min in Minnesota. We've done Texas, Oklahoma, um, southeastern data from all around here, uh, all the way up to North Carolina, Pennsylvania. And we have live data in some locations too, but it all kind of started right here where we are so today. S Steve, quick question. How many deer do you have collars on and, and how many states? Um, right now, don't have collars on anything, on any deer. Okay. Um, but I think at the time... We had, let's see, 45, 100. We probably gave you, we probably had about 200 deer. Yeah, I was going to say 200. Ballpark, yep. um, that, that, that we had, that from different studies that we were working with. And, you know, come, coming back to his talk about how we met, um, you know, really the real reason was it was, it was kind of like a tick. I just couldn't quite get it <laughs> unembedded. And, you know, and I said, well, I'm just going to have to deal with this. Um, but, but, but no, um, you know, it, in all honesty, you know, talking with him, I became very intrigued. You know, he wasn't – the skill set that he was bringing to the table with regards to his military work and that sort of thing was, was some pretty complex math, you know, far outshine me, you know, in any way. And, and he was really looking at it in a, in a complex manner. And I said, boy, you know, there, there could be some common ground here. And so I was really interested in seeing what they could do with it. That and the fact that, you know, in reality, it's the data are public. We're a public university. Um, and, you know, it's he could do a FOIA request, Freedom of Information Act, and technically get it. Um, I wasn't trying to give away data, but you know, just said, "Okay, let's let's do let's work on this together in a way." You're the brains. Let me let's consult a little bit on it. You know, let me know how I can help. Um, let's let's come back together every so often and discuss. You know, the progress with this. Um, so we gave him a bunch of data, and, and what he said was right. Is you know, there's a lot of folks out there that are doing modeling. Um, you know, in my field from a scientific perspective, but other people, you know, in the private sector that are that are building models, and and a, and a mistake that's commonly made is building a model with a data set and then testing it with the same data. Well, you're going to get phenomenal accuracy that way. And you know, we 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 talked about this originally, and you know how he broke it up. I wasn't involved in that, but it's like you got to keep some data aside to test it. You know, use a majority of it, 70, 80, 90 percent to build a model, but come back and test it with independent data to see if you're right. You can add those data later um, to improve the model. You said they were getting phenomenal accuracy, but false accuracy, right? Wait, wait, wait. If the model's accurate for that set of deer, right. is it accurate for all deer? Right. Um, and so, you know, if you test a model with the, with the data that was used to build it, you're going to get artificially inflated estimates of accuracy. We um, call it overfitting in artificial intelligence. It's essentially... I, I always explain it this way. Um, I could teach someone about Greek history and have them read a bunch of books and get a general understanding for Greek history. And no matter where they go, if they take a test from an academic, they're going to do well, right? Because they have a general understanding of the history of, you know, the, the Greek city states. Or I could take a test and then train a student to take a test and say, these are the questions you're going to get. Now, and then see how they do on the test. That, now, if you, you can train anyone in a day to do really well on a test, but what you want to do is get a general intelligence concerning things like deer movement and, um, 
you can only do do that by getting a large data set. You know, as he said, 200 deer there were over those 200 deer, let's just say the average, which I think was pretty conservative to say is between a year of data on each deer, right? That's 200 deer. We're in excess of 2000 years of deer data now from all over the U S. Um, so what we have is a model that has a general understanding of what the general deer does, not a specific deer, um, which is the only thing you can hope to do with a model. So, you know, I guess something else that he mentioned that, you know, is he says you got about, you know, 65% accuracy or something like that with your models. And I think a lot of people would say, well, that's not very good. You're, you're, only, you're only accurate two out of every three times. The reality is, I, you know, from my perspective, that's phenomenal. Um, to be able to say, to know wh- what that deer is going to be doing two out of every three times and to be able to predict that when you're just sitting in your living room is exceptional. A wild one. animal. Yes, yeah. yes, that, that have unique personalities, that, that do different things, that are being driven by, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to call climate and, and weather patterns random, but not random, but you just don't know how they're moving, you don't know what direction the wind's going to be blowing, you don't know when they're going to run into a predator and get bounced by a hunter, whatever those things are, there's so many factors out that are influencing that behavior to be able to go out there and say, this is what's going on, you know, and, and I, to, to put it into context, you know, I think about humans, you know, we all have our own patterns, you know, we may go to Chick-fil-A on a certain day or, you know, we're Monday night football freaks, so you can predict that, you know, I'm going to be sitting there in the recliner on Monday evening and be fairly accurate, but to be able to do that 24-7 and to be able to say, where are you? To be able to say two-thirds of the time, you can t- say where that person's going to be or what they're going to be doing with a fair level of accuracy outside of sleeping patterns, that'd be pretty good. Because we change our patterns all the time. You know, there's a traffic jam, so I had to go around. There was a train. There was this. Uh, you know, my, my wife called, and so I needed to go run an errand over here, and so I was at the grocery store when I would normally be there. There's things that are just happening that are changing that. So this two-thirds level of accuracy, I think, is phenomenal. And I would argue, and I don't have data to show this, but I would I would guess that that models and, and groups that are out there saying we're 80% accurate, we're 90% accurate, that you can make the data say whatever you want, or you can make your evaluation of the data, whatever you want. Um, but they're going to have a hard time beating, you know, you know, Bill and his crew are, are evaluating accuracy in a very conservative way. And so, I mean, I, I think they've really got a solid, solid product. Uh, you kind of said one thing about human pressure, like bump by a hunter, Bill, I, I remember you telling me one time, uh, you'll have to remind me, but it was like, a piece of property and these guys were hunting a specific deer or whatever. And they didn't think the deer was on the property, Yes, but it was living amongst them the whole time. It was yeah. just avoiding the, the entire time. Was that actually like data pulled from a deer? I mean, yes, I, that was a Louisiana deer on like a, um, a hunting club that had allowed a university that we got deer data from and essentially, and now this is not this again, I only tell the story to tell about the exceptional, um, this is an exception to the rule. This is not everywhere. I've not seen this. Maybe Steve has seen it more than I have, but essentially the, the, they called this deer, the nickname for this deer was the traveler. And they had like a 2000 acre property where they, every once in a while at night, they catch the traveler on this, on this hunting club. Well, they had had these stands in the same place for many, many years. They'd never moved them. They, you know, they had their feed stations or their cameras and all of these things and where they knew where there were scrapes and, and those types of things. Well, this deer had been tagged um, and they'd killed it at like two in the morning. And, you know, the, when I was talking to the guy that was the, uh, had participated in the study, he had actually graduated, left, went to a private company, but put me in contact with that research team. And they had been hunting on that property and called him the traveler. And they said, well, it's, we only, when we see him on a deer camera, it's two or three in the morning. He's never on this property. He was a massive Louisiana deer. I want to say he's like 160 inches or something like that. Wow. Um, and uh, the only person that had seen it had been like a kid or something that had been hunting the area, had saw it on the hoof. Otherwise, no one had ever seen it on the hoof. Well, anyway, the deer, I want to say, and I'm going to maybe get this part wrong, but had passed away from natural causes or the tag dropped. I can't remember which one it was. I believe it was passed away from natural causes. And they ended up, you know, they weren't sharing with the hunters the GPS locations of these deer that were on the property. That'd be unethical. Um, But it was essentially this really steep part of the property overlooking a swamp that all of them walked by the top of it. All of them had gone, had stands peripheral to it. And he lived in this like 70 acre area that nobody went into. No one saw deer in there. No one said there were, they figured there would be no deer in there. 
Um, and, but the interesting thing about that deer was, <clears throat> and again, I don't say that this is every deer. I, I, again, I'll look to Steve to provide context on this, but he had scent checked where they knew there were scrapes where they had cameras. He would just walk by them and he would walk downwind of them. He would never walk and actually go and work the scrape. He had no interest in scraping, working the scrape. He just wanted to scent check them and, I, I'm guessing, again, um, I always feel foolish talking about this stuff next to an academic who's probably going to know better than I would. But my guess is he just wanted to send check the does and just send check the bucks and know who's who in the zoo, but had no interest in actually competing. Um, or if he did compete, it wasn't in the areas that they thought it was. And the deer ended up being on the property. And the GPS data was clear. The deer had been living on that property the whole time. It was in these people's midst on this 2,000 or 2,500-acre area. Um, but stayed in this 70 acre area during the day where they thought there were no deer and then would move at night and go all of these places. And a lot of times they, if they had had a camera just downwind of a camera, they might've seen him send checking a scrape or a rub line or whatever, but he just wasn't going up and had no interest in participating in the traditional sense that you'd think a dominant deer like that would be. And I think he died of natural causes at like nine years old or something like that. So, I mean, I, I, I think it's pretty common. I mean, I mean, I think so you too. Know, you, 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 you know, all, all the the questions you hear from hunters, the stories you hear, and, and, and everything. It's, you know, I, you know, people say things to me, and I always kind of come back with this comment that say, you know, what do deer for, do for a living? Is they stay alive. You know, this is a prey species, and you know, to be successful, you know, whether that was five hundred years ago before, you know, or, or you know even 100 years ago before modern hunting and all the technology that we throw at it or a thousand years ago, whatever it was, you know, they're avoiding predation. And, you know, they learn the habits of the predators that are out there. And we're the easiest predator to predict. I mean, we can reach out and touch them as opposed to other predators. But we're super simple, you know, whether it's it's the squeak on the gate. You know, every deer hunter needs to have a four wheeler or some sort of UTV to drive the 200 yards into their stand with so we're announcing our presence we sit just like in your story we sit in the same stand every time um we have the same patterns the same scent come august it you know we start going out there and putting out cameras you know we got to see what's out there we, we are so easily patterned as hunters that i think we make it very easy for them particularly with how stationary we become with our hunting we're already kind of jumping into some of the conversations that are questions that we had. And I think that, um, one of the questions are just, sorry, we okay. (laughs) One of the, uh, the questions we had, or, or or this is really just kind of in, in Drew and I's hunting experiences that I've always, we've always kind of made the statement that like, I don't think we give these deer enough credit for how smart they are. And they are amazing at patterning us because every single year, I think every hunter has experienced this. If they've ever, ever chased, especially like a particular buck, I think every hunter has experienced the cat and mouse game where it's, oh, he was there the one day I didn't sit in my stand. He showed up in daylight. And every time you sit there, he's nowhere to be seen. The one day you're gone, boom, he's in there. Like, you know, and I I think that that is, for how often and how much that occurs to us every single year, it's not coincidence that, and the, I think that these deer are patterning us and they're able to figure out when we're in their territory and when we're not. Um, that is something that happens. To, we, we have so much that we still have to learn. We've been doing this a long time. Say, well, 16 years we've been hunting around Atlanta and, and all the hunting we've been doing but we still have so much to learn. And this continues to happen to us even today of these bucks that just, even when we think we're doing everything perfect, there is something they're picking up on that is, that is keying them to our presence in their territory. And they're amazing at it. And it, it, it drives us nuts. You know, I I think you're exactly right. And and, and let me put all this into context is, is I'm no great hunter. I don't spend a lot of time hunting anymore. It's all I do is eat, drink and sleep deer here at work. And so when, Saturday morning comes, it's like, yeah, I think I'm going to go golfing. Yeah. You know, and I enjoy it when I go out there, but, you know, I don't, I don't, you know, I'm sure you guys are far better hunters than I am. Um, I just deal with data and understand patterns. Um, and the patterns that we've seen, you know, with our work is 
these deer are very, very good at avoiding humans. Um, very good at detecting humans. Um, and I think, that, you know, like you said, the things that we do, a, a, a shooting tower on a food plot. Well, the shooting tower in and of itself I don't think is a big deal, but the, the fact that every time it rains, we hunt in the enclosed blind. Every time we take a child, every time we're running late, well, I can sneak into that real easy. Well, we just leave a trail of scent to and from every time, and every deer that comes walking by for the next three, six hours says, oh, they were here. They were here. They were here. And so it's, it's an area of high human activity. Um, although the one thing that I do, I've got a, I got a small piece of property that I hunt. Um, I mean, it's about a thousand acres, so a good size, but you know, pretty much have, there's very little, other, very little other hunting there is when I do go hunting, it's like, where am I going to sit? And I figure it out between the time I leave the house and the time I get there. And I just sit on the ground and I sit against a tree and it's like, oh, am I going to go sit in that ridge or am I going to sit in that bottom or gosh, there's a wind out of the West. I'm going to sit on that open field this, on this day. I'm sitting in a different spot every time. And it's completely unpredictable because I don't have a clue where I'm going to sit. I mean, generally it's kind of the same spots that I've learned over time, but it's, there's no regular pattern of disturbance. That's for sure that they can use year after year after year. And I've talked to a lot of scientists that have, that are, are a couple that have kind of document kept track of their own hunting pressure and kind of built built a relief map or a heat map of their own hunting pressure and then will go in the next year and only hunt areas that they've never hunted before and their hunting success doubles and even hmm. triples yeah I, I i we've always kind of said when we've hung a new stand your first sit's your best sit it is so if you're constantly keeping them on their toes and that's how we've actually ended up killing a lot of of, of the deer we've killed over the years is They've patterned us, and we ended up figuring out that they had patterned us, and so we used that against them. I hunted a deer where I, I, I accessed the same way in and out, parked my truck in the same spot fifty time, at least 50 times in a row in one season. The one time I accessed from the different other side of the property, I killed him. So I sat 50 times accessing from the same spot, changed it up one time, and killed that deer. And I was sitting there scratching my head at all 50 sets being like, he was here yesterday. I, you know, why, yep. where's he at? Where, and, and it's, so I've, I've got another question kind of piggybacking on the, the scent thing. Obviously deer are really good at smelling humans. Um, but I, it, this is my question for you. Is that it, it's a step further than that. Like they can tell time, like, can they tell, Oh, it, it's been an hour since this person's been here or it, this is kind of like a day old or, um, and, and possibly also like how long can deer still smell your presence after you've even left the woods? It, it, to be perfectly honest, I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. Okay. To, 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 to your, I guess you had three questions there. Um, I would assume that they're able to detect this is, this is fresh or this is not. Mm -hmm. um, I'm going to assume that due to the strength of the scent, you know, that it's, it's going to wear away. How long that takes, I don't know. Mm -hmm. um, it, it, I, would, I would think that people that would be really good to talk to about that are some of your, um, some of your folks that, ha that have trailing dogs. They would have as good an understanding as anybody on, on scents and how long it lasts. I mean, I know that they can go in after a fair bit and, you know, and trail humans. You know, you can, after multiple hours, you can go get, a, you know, a tracking dog and go in after that deer, you know, even the next morning and, tra and, and track that deer. So it's got to be there for, you know, 6, 8, 10, 12 hours. Um, so if I'm, you know, obviously they're, they're normally trailing blood in that case, but I would say it's got it's got to be a while. Mm -hmm. uh, but it's going to depend upon conditions. And I think it's going to depend upon the deer, you know, and, and just us on, on certain days. There's some day where that deer picks right up on, on your scent trail. But you've seen other days where a deer walks right across it and doesn't even pay attention to it. I don't know. It's weird. Mm. We're gonna bounce some some questions off of you. I have no idea if if like <laughs> it's a fitting question or not. So uh, you know, if just, it's just if, tell, tell you you're crazy if I think you're crazy. <laughs> yeah, maybe so. <laughs> well, before we start throwing questions out there, I'm curious, kind of, to take a step back a little bit and kind of hear about what experiments you've done and what studies you've done on the deer. I know you did the, the GPS collar stuff was a while ago. It sounds like, yeah, we, we've, we've done, you know, we've done several studies with, with GPS. Um, we had, um, we've done some work in South Carolina that was taking a look at movement patterns of bucks and does. 
Um, we've, a lot of that work was looking at movements relative to hunting. Um, we, we did some work here for the state of Alabama we were, where we were examining survival rates and movement patterns. Um, so we had both bucks and does, GPS collared. Um, we also had another study we did actually did inside of a high fence to try and understand what's the movements inside of a high fence. Um, and it's, so we've had, mul- it, it just, we've had multiple studies like that, um, that have kind of, that have, they've all been designed to examine aspects of movement, but they all produce the same data at the end of the day, which is, you know, highly precise locations at a specific time. Most of our deer we've had that we've radio collared have been, collecting data every 15 minutes or every 30 minutes. And I consider that to be hyper accurate. Mm -hmm. You know, and I look back and when I did my PhD in Oklahoma, we put radio collars on deer. We were using VHF technology. We'd have to go out there with an antenna, you know, locate it and then take a, take a bearing with a compass and then drive another spot on the road, take a bearing from a different angle and, and sit there and then go to a third spot and test the accuracy, essentially triangulate that animal. So I'd spend 20 minutes just getting a location on one animal. Then there's another 10 minutes driving to the next animal. <laughs> We've got 50 radio collars out there. You're dead by the time you're done with that. And I got one fix, whereas the data we have today, I sit there in my office and every 15, 20, 30 minutes, would, however it's programmed, it's downloading that GPS coordinate that it's just like, this is sweet. It's just the data available today are, are amazing from mm-hmm. a scientific perspective. And then to be able to use them, you know, for in, the, in the ways that, you know, Bill and his crew are using them and, you know, try and educate hunters. I have so many questions. Yeah, just off that one. But, so many questions. You know, it's, what, but some of the, th- you, you asked, you know, what were the studies we did? Some of them are, are movement patterns. What's the home range? How, how often are they leaving properties? Some of the things that we found really interesting is how are they moving relative to hunters? And... One of our studies in South Carolina, and, and it's it, it's on our, our Auburn Deer Lab website um, that was published, you know, back in 2017, maybe. I can't remember the exact year. Um, Jeff Sullivan, one of our former students, did it. We would, we had really good data from this South Carolina property where they would put a hunter. And this was, this was research that was funded by the South Carolina Department of Natural Resources. Um, and we, we did it on a private piece of property, Brosnan Forest in, in South Carolina. Uh, but we had very accurate information on where hunters were. Because out there, they would drop off their hunters at a stand, leave them there, come back and pick them up. Hunters were not moving around. Um, and we had, we had GPS collared deer that were around the area. And what we took a look at was what we were able to calculate the probability of a deer going to a food plot in the days following a hunting, hunter sitting there. And so we could see the regular use of those areas, but then what was the probability of them going to that food plot during daylight hours in day one, two, three, four, five, following that. Sitting there on the day that the, that the hunter was there, probability was the same. But the next day, the probability decreased significantly of really? that deer going in there. It had already been hunted. The, the hunter had hunted it that morning or evening, but at night, the deer had detected the presence mm-hmm. of that hunter after the hunter was already gone. So the probability of them going back the next day was far lower for them coming in before dark. And it, slow, and it, it lasted, it was a lag effect of about five days. How mu- what, what kind of percentage are we talking about here? You know, probably a 30%, 40% decrease. Now, we only had collars on 15 animals at any one time. And so we didn't have a huge data set to be able to examine and say, what are all the deer in the country doing Mm -hmm. and all of the bucks and all the does. We had 15, you know, we we looked at all the buck data. We looked at all the doe data that we had. I think it was all bucks and does. I can't remember exactly what, it's been too long, what deer we looked at. But there was was enough of a decrease that it's like, there's a 40% decrease in the probability that deer I'm trying to hunt is going to show up on day two. I'm going somewhere else. Mm Mm-hmm. Um, or make that one sit count, make sure the conditions are perfect. And I, I think that's something really important that we could talk about, you know, forever yeah. is, you know, don't, don't ruin a spot. You make sure the conditions are right. If, if the wind's wrong, don't go sit there. Um, the other way we looked at it was um, we had, we had a, a project funded by the Alabama Division of Wildlife, Freshwater Fisheries. The Wildlife Division wanted to understand survival and movement patterns. And so we... We took the data, um, we, we, we addressed their questions, but then we also took the data and examined probability of daylight movement relative to day of the week. And what we found was the probability of daylight movement was pretty high on Sunday, started Saturday, 
started to drop on Sunday, crashed on Monday, was still pretty low on Tuesday, started to come, on, come back up on Wednesday, was good Thursday, was good Friday, started slight drop on Saturday, drop on Sunday, crash on Monday. And what it is, is when's everybody in the woods? We can warriors. Saturday and Sunday. I mean, yep. it's just the reality of, of the world we live in. And by Monday, these deer are like, I'm not moving. They're not, you know, not realizing that nobody's in the woods anymore during the day. They're like, this is really bad. Come Wednesday, they're saying, you know, there's nobody around. They're starting to show the p- pattern back again. And we we could see it very obvious, you know, that, it, that pattern as well. Yeah, Lee and I are, we kind of started off in outdoors as bass fishermen. And it's kind of crazy to go fish a big public lake like Gunnersville or Alabama has a ton of great bass fishing lakes. But you go fish it on a weekend and there's hundreds and hundreds of boats out there and the bite's really tough but then you go like a monday or tuesday and it's like a different lake and it's just wild to think that even fish there's probably i mean you're probably catching on a weekend one percent of the fish in the lake not even that but all the fish still realize like oh there's baits and boats and prop wash all over the place i'm just gonna hunker down in this cover and not bite anything they just get super conditioned it's wild And you think if a fish can do that, a deer is Absolutely. just at a totally different level. So it's, it is, I think we underestimate these animals so much. I, I think we do, you know, and, and, you know, you, you mentioned, um, you know, don't go in and hunt the, unless the conditions are mm-hmm. right. Um, you, you know, you're going to, you're going to ruin that area. You're going to ruin it. Yeah. I think if people, if, if people realize that they have a 40% chance, less, less of a chance of seeing that buck the next day, if they hunt the, pro, hunt the food plot one day then they're going to make sure that that first hit conditions are right. But, you know, I think, but also I think it's important to understand is why are, why are hunters in the woods? And the reason you guys are in the woods is different than the reason that the next person's in the woods. For sure. sure. Um, You know, and there's, there's, it's like, Hey, this is, this is, this is where I get away. This is, this is my, Mm -hmm. my therapy. Go sit, go sit. But if you are interested in that one deer, if you're interested in in, in getting that trophy, and if you're interested in that, that success, then I think we I think we need to spend less time in the woods, more time sitting here saying when is the right time for me to be there. Mm-hmm. I mean I think you need to be out there and take advantage of the opportunities, but just understand the more you spend out there, the more pressure you put on those animals. Yeah. In that study, were you able to uh, see a difference between mature collared bucks versus does, or was it not that specific? We just we didn't have enough data. Okay. Um, it's you know. I, if we could get enough data that you could maybe detect differences, but it may be harder on does for all I know. I mean, a doe is going to be more susceptible to a predator in theory than a buck just due to his smaller body size, you would think. Mm-hmm. Um, but a doe is also, you know, at the mercy of her fawns. And so might be lured out there easier. I don't True, know. Yeah. I don't know. What is the furthest you've ever seen a deer travel? I've I've seen some five five mile movements in a night, one direction. Um, during my PhD, I did it in southeast Oklahoma. Um, studied deer on the McAllister Army Ammunition Plant. Um, probably the best population of deer in the country that the public can hunt. I remember talking to you about that back in 2010 because I was trying to pull a draw the quota for that. Yeah, and I, was, I had asked you about that. I think you had brought it up during class one day. Yeah, I, I probably mentioned it back then. Amazing, amazing deer herd, incredible soils, and well managed, um, so that they're not over harvesting. Um, but you know, we had we had bucks that were radio collared on that property, and we had an individual buck one night. We couldn't locate it. We would located it on the base, and it, it, we had, this this deer was within a mile of the perimeter at any one time, and we couldn't find it, couldn't find it, couldn't find it. All of a sudden, we got up on a real high point, got a real faint signal to the west, ended up driving off the base, and it, it, it was five miles away. It was on this wooded hill um, that was surrounded by a lot of pasture, a couple of brushy draws. And it's like, wow, you know, hadn't seen that before. Five miles. This was during this. This would have been in November. Um, during hunting season, so this would probably would have been some sort of breeding excursion. Mm-hmm. Um, next day, it was back. It's like, okay, it made it. The next week, it decided to try it again. It made it about a quarter mile. <laughs> Boom. 
Dang. Yep. Wow. Yep. Off of the off uh, of the uh, army uh, plant. Yep. Off the post there, and um, somebody got it hunting one of those draws. You know, came walking by. So, I, two things. One, I've also in November had a buck on one of those breeding excursions before. We've we I know we've talked about it before in probably other podcasts, but I had trail camera a trail camera b they were almost seven miles apart he showed up in the on the in the same night on both cameras and ended up going right back to where he started and I, that's that's in atlanta where they're crossing very difficult to 10, go on a straight roads. line yeah. yeah and we've and we have data from uh, further excursions um you know it's a, there, there's 10 and 15 mile excursions and we, we we see them on all sorts of different properties but yeah, yeah. They're, they're they're doing it the other thing too is uh i was hunting tennessee last year and I was hunting a spot and the, I was hunting the morning, but the evening prior, a buddy, a buddy of mine had spotted the deer I was hunting three miles away. And the, the major part of me was like, what are the odds he's going to be there in the morning? Super slim. He was three miles away the evening before. He's probably hanging out over there, you know, chasing does around doing his thing over there. He's three miles away. I'm hunting the next morning. I'm like, I'm not feeling that confident. Right at first daylight, he was there. Back in the place I've been hunting him, three miles from where he was the evening before, and I killed him that morning. But we think about this, and three miles is like, man, that's a long ways. But It's really nothing. You, 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 you and I can walk three miles in 45 minutes. Any one of us. Yep. Walk. You know, I, 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 you know, I walk in the mornings. I'm getting too old, unlike you guys, to, to run anymore. My knees just won't take it. But, for, for you know three miles that's an hour and, and it's 45 it's minutes and it's weird because well it's not weird but it's uh i don't know if it's just more to do with the environment that a certain deer is in or if it is just every deer has certain personalities we've had deer that i mean we're not obviously not getting a full scope of of their movements but we have deer that we've consistently seen that travel the cover a long ways that we're getting on cameras from all over the place but then we've also had deer that seem to have a lot smaller ranges. And I don't know if that is just because, you know, it, it's, would you agree that it seems like the really older, older deer have, have smaller ranges. And then it seems that some of these like three to four year old yeah. bucks are the ones that are kind of running around like crazy. So I, I don't know if an old deer like that has been conditioned to be like, this is the zone I'm safe in. I've never had issues here. I'm cool to just kind of like, it's like they spend ninety percent of my time in that area. They get more precise with their range as they get older. It seems like they may have like one or two areas, but they stay in those couple areas. I've I've seen patterns all over the place. As far as the excursions, it seems to me like it's young. I see it more with younger deer. Um, the data we've looked at, um, and, and you asked about all the studies. I don't see the data as much anymore. You know, I've got a I've got a team, and you know, I've been fortunate, great individuals that I work with here that are kind of doing a lot of the day to day stuff and get intimate knowledge of each of the individuals and are looking at the data. Um, I'm kind of seeing it more after it's been examined and, and, and working on multiple projects. But you know, when I was during my PhD, I was I was one of those guys that was looking at the data all the time. And you know, we had we had eighty bucks, you know, anywhere from one and a half to nine and a half years old radio collar during this study there at there at McAllister and. You know, we saw multiple different patterns. You know, we had the, that one that walked off the base. We had another individual who was about a three-year-old deer, four-year-old deer. In three years, he never left that section hardly. Hmm. It was a 600 to 800 acres, always there. Um, the biggest buck that we radio collared was 177 inches at six and a half years old. It was a little bit bigger the next year. He spent the rut in this section. The next year was another section over. The year after that was a whole another section over. So he's constantly most, changing. He was constantly changing each year. The most heavily hunted area on the property. Um, and, 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 you know, nobody was able to, ever able to harvest him. Um, we had another individual that was, it was a four and a half year old. We tra- trapped him as a four and a half year old. Eight point, he was 140 some inches. He rutted there. The next year he was there. The next year, he moved two miles and never left that spot, that section. Uh, we had another individual that we trapped that he would spend the rut in this section, and then he would move five miles, and he would spend the, spend the late spring, summer, up until mid-October. He would move back to where he was trapped, where he rutted, and each year he would make that five-mile movement, have a summer mm-hmm. range, and have a, have a, a rut, a breeding season wintering range. 
and every one is different. I mean, most of them are pretty, you know, show some high sight fidelity. They're loyal to their area, but it can be all over the board. And that's why I say as hunters, you never know what you're going to see. Yeah, it's, I mean, th- I think they're just like people in that regard that everybody's got different personalities. They're all going to behave different because we, we've we seen deer that will sometimes, we know they summer in a certain area, but it, their internal clock is unreal because sometimes almost to the day, like October 1st or what you know whatever date, it's like we've seen some deer return to their fall areas or their rut areas almost to the exact day. And it's just like, how in the world do these deer just, just keep track of it? And it's, it's amazing to see, like, for example, we had a deer way down the river in a park and he summered in that park. Well, in about October, I think it was like October 1st within, and this was like three years in a row within like a 24, 48 hour time span around October 1st, he would show back up probably three miles away up river every year and it was just like you know to me it amazed me how they know that it's just something in them that triggers that they're like oh yeah it's time to time to move up there and it almost sometimes can be to the exact day Um, but we've also seen countless times where and this is this was kind of leading to one of my next questions we've seen where we thought a deer has gone missing some oh maybe a hunter got him maybe got hit by a car deer's gone missing and then maybe the next year uh we end up seeing uh someone harvested that deer and it was miles away where, you know, j- the deer had clearly left the area and has now kind of relocated. Do you think that these deer are constantly sort of figuring out where they fit in? Because I know countless times we've harvested a mature buck out of an area. And then it seems like another one has kind of moved in to take that area. He like claimed the area. So like, do you think these deer are kind of always sort of feeling out like, if a young buck's just getting tormented by some mature buck in this area, he's just like, I'm going to leave and kind of find where I'm not getting my tail whooped. I mean, do you think these deer are constantly trying to figure out sort of where they belong or like they find a new area that's better than where they lived the last three years and they're kind of like, yeah, I'll stay here now. It's, I, I think there's probably just a lot of personality in it. I, I, th- I think to answer your question, yes, I, I would assume to some degree. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, and I'll take it another level, you know, with my answer is number one, I think there's a lot of personalities involved. And so no different than us. You know, I don't think they're thinking of it on a conscience level, conscious level like we are saying, boy, I just, I don't like it here anymore. But I think they are constantly trying to maximize their probability to pass on their genes, which, which that, the, maximizing that involves making sure I get the nutrition I need, making sure I grow the antlers, making sure I survive, making sure I can find breeding opportunities and successfully compete for them. They're constantly trying to figure that out. Some are better at it than others. You're gonna, I think you're going to have varying levels of intelligence, whatever that means for a deer. Um, I think ability to learn, ability to varying levels of ability to you know, smell, and detect hunters and predators. You throw in all that variability, and I think you've, each critter is a little bit different. And so and then, then it's like, boy, you know, I've got a lot of competition here. Boy, it doesn't, it's time for me to move. They're, for whatever reason, they're getting that bump. You, know, I, you start to also factor in, and this is you know, all the reasons that you said, you also start to factor in that maybe they're trying to breed with individual does. Hmm. And this is something that, you I've know, never this, even thought about it, that. It, it, it's it's not. We just tend to think that they're just trying to breed whatever doe, but but in reality, there's a lot of data out there, and the data start with humans. So there's some really really interesting studies that they've done with humans that show that you know, that, and these studies historically are done with a white T-shirt. You know, I'll have some guy wear a white T-shirt to bed, or fifty guys wear a white T-shirt to bed, stick it in a Ziploc bag, and then they'll have a panel of women that that smell it and rate the attractiveness. And then they compare it to genetics, and they compare it to this. They compare it to, you know, they put the pictures of guys up on a thing, up on a up on a up on a screen, and you rate how attractive they are. And there's, you we all know people are attracted to different, you know, have different tastes in 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 partners, and there's the, it's scientifically known that there's certain 
genetic characteristics out there that would be best suited for each individual. It's best for me not to, not to you know, b- to reproduce with somebody that's closely related. We all know that. We talk about inbreeding. We talk about these things. Well, that, that's a real thing. Well, there's a lot of information out there that's, that's suggesting that there's, there could be certain genetic combinations that a potential partner in humans or mate in deer has that increases the probability of your offspring being quote-unquote better or more genetically diverse or something. And if they have the ability to detect that, humans can by scent. Why can't deer? I have a lot of jokes I'm referring to. <laughs> right I, I, I know, I know, I know, I know. This, this, I'm this, really this, holding back this now. Conversa- <laughs> this conversation could, could spiral downhill real quickly. Yeah. But, 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 but if if that's true, we we know for a fact in humans that there's a tendency to rate the attractiveness of somebody you've never seen before on a white T-shirt and compare the genetics that those individuals tend to be more distantly related as opposed that have more distant genetics as opposed to that have, those have more similar genetics. Not meaning they're related. They just have some of the same alleles, some of the same mm-hmm. genetic markers. Well, if that's true, that humans are able to detect that, then it's got to be true for deer, raccoons, everything else. And if that's true, and you are a dominant buck. And in reality, our data show that bucks, you know, for them to produce, for, for a dominant buck to, and we're doing this in our deer research facility, that'd be a whole nother hour, hour and a half conversation that, that we didn't even talk about that. Um, for, the, for them to, if, 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 if the most they can produce is maybe five, breed five does, and maybe not even be successful with those five does. But let's say that's all they're able to get in the breeding season. That then, if I'm the dominant buck, why wouldn't I go into the breeding season and go, Susie, Jenny, and Mary? I need to focus on them. If my ultimate goal is to pass on my genetics, mm-hmm. it's not saying I'm not going to take an opportunity, another opportunity presents itself. But my focus this this season is going to be to try and, 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 and pin those three down on when they're available and compete for opportunities with them. I've never thought about it this way. That's super interesting. Now you fact, but if, you fa- if that's true, and that's just a, yeah. it's a pet theory I have, if that's true, coming back to your question, why do these deer move the way they do? So one of my questions is, kind of back to what you talked to before, you see deer change their home range at some point during their life. I, th- I think a lot of what we've kind of um, discovered just running trail cameras is around that three, two to three year old range, a buck will just kind of leave his area and go find a new area. Do you think that's because you're trying to get away from similar genetic does? Maybe because, you know, let, let's think back to how did that buck in the, end up there in the first place? Because it was probably born there. I'm assuming, it, it, but maybe not. Maybe, maybe not. Because what happens is, okay, a buck fawn's born at about a year, some time between a year, year and a half of age, normally what's going to ha- happen is they're going to disperse. Mama's going to start to push them out, discourage them, whatever there is. There, there's, a, there's an internal mechanism to reduce potential for inbreeding. The young males disperse at about a year to year and a half of age. If mother dies, most of those deer don't disperse. About 85% stay where they are. Really? If that's true, then the, the the way the way female deer work is there's something called the rose petal hypothesis. Is those daughters establish home ranges that overlap with the mother. So the potential exists that these are all a lot more closely related does. Maybe that is why they move, and that's where I'm. You know, that could be a factor. It could be a factor that these does that are here don't jive with my genetics. It could be I I I don't know you know I'm th- I'm spitballing stuff and like I said this whole thing that I, a buck prefers a doe that is not something that's that's talked about much in science we talk about it with humans is it do you think it's possible to do a study to get some sort of data on that <sighs> we're doing some things you know you know to to go into in depth on it it it's, it'd be very 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 difficult um, we have one of the few places you could do it our deer research facility. Um, it requires having intimate knowledge of the individuals that are out there. And it's just, it's at a depth of knowledge that you need of each individual that you can't do on a free-ranging setting, mm-hmm. um, number one. Number two is, at the end of the day, it's 
it's interesting campfire talk or to sit around you know and, and, and have a beer and talk about it but when you get to the deer management level that was going to be my next question <laughs> it's, you, you, you can't do can you about groom it. can you groom the does on your pro- or harvest the does on your property to only keep the no. ones that are breed worthy but, but you don't know but but because you don't know what bucks are going to attract but in but, the first but, place. but but the net but the next buck is going to be suitable for that other doe right you, you just don't know and you know you can get into this depth and it's a it's a great academic discussion but in reality as far as deer management i just i don't know maybe 100 years from now they've got something figured out to 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 apply it on the landscape but really uh-huh. that that sort of stuff the way we look at it is to try and understand breeding systems that apply to wildlife in general not just deer we're using deer as a model you know when we're stock, talking about that level but it's an interesting concept and can come back to explain some of the, the patterns that you see is to say well maybe it's not so simple that they're going over there for food maybe it's not so simple that they're running from a dominant buck mm-hmm. you know there could be a many other reasons that are just we don't put we don't think about deer in that way I, i'm gonna be honest i'm a little embarrassed i feel so shallow minded now that i was like <laughs> you know i always thought like the first day they see you just going after well you. this was my thought was you know when a, we've kind of seen like a two-year-old or three-year-old deer we've always looked at those deer and kind of be like they're unpredictable they may not they may settle here they may branch out and go some you know settle up somewhere else like they haven't really found their real home range yet because we see them just kind of vanish so often and they'll you know we'll get them on camera way away i always just thought it was like you know if a mature six-year-old buck is in the same area as them at one year old that that six-year-old i don't was just like i don't care about that one and a half year old he's he's nothing to me but when a deer is starting to enter two and three and they're overlapping really hard in their areas my thinking was uh, you know that deer at two and three is now more of a becoming more of a presence, more of a dominant deer in that area, more of a kind of threat to this six year old. And the six year old is going to kind of really try and push those deer out. I mean, again, that's just spitballing. And, but there's not, now I understand there's a thousand other factors that could have caused some of these two or three year old deer to, you know, go somewhere else or end up somewhere else or do what they're doing. And, 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 and I, and I don't think, you know, something that you said there, that, that, that six year old going up, that's a threat coming. I don't think, I would assume that they don't think like that. Um, I've always kind of thought of, you know, I kind of, I, I really plug my students with this. They say, well, they're territory. Well, deer aren't territorial. They do not defend space. Um, they, they, they exhibit no territoriality. So as far as overlap, it's not a big deal. Um, but during, during the breeding season, when you've got that aggression, you've got those testosterone levels high and they're competing for opportunities, they probably have a, a sphere of stay the heck out of here. Mm -hmm. I, I don't, you know, stay the heck out of here. And maybe, and maybe what you're saying is, you know, you get two equally matched individuals when they come together, you know, one's walking the trail, you know, east, the other one's walking the trail west, and they come together, you know, maybe they're going to lock up. Um, but I don't, I don't even think they're thinking about anybody else. So if they're not territorial, except for during, like during breeding season, how come they split up their bachelor groups once their velvet comes off and testra- because, testosterone starts? Because there's sp- space that. of tolerance. I think their space of tolerance is... <laughs> You know they can they can handle them around ten yards, but it's just they're not going to tolerate them inside that little sp- inside that small space. And mm-hmm. I, I just think there's a natural thing is it's time for me to go start looking and doing my thing, yeah. which is you know which is scraping and, and, and going and checking out you know s- starting to establish their presence, you know making sure that the does and the bucks know I'm here. I mean to me that's what a scrape is. I am here. I will be back. Um, and it's not necessarily claiming the territory; it's claiming the does that are in that territory. I don't, I don't think it's even claiming the does. You don't. Um, it, it, it's called a t- it's a tending bond system, where you know they're going to identify a doe. You know she's coming into heat; they're going to tend her, and they're going to defend that doe. Meanwhile, every other doe's free for. You know they're not tending them; they're tending that one doe. They don't care about the other three does with her. They don't care about anything else going around. It's that one doe. Um, 
and trying to establish that bond and hopefully breed and then defend her from if another male come if another juvenile male young uh, subordinate male comes you know be like uh uh-uh. uh you can stand out there 100 yards that's fine i don't care you you can't do anything there but if another comparable male or a dominant male comes that's where it becomes interesting do you think that antler size uh, has an intimidation factor amongst deer. Like, you know, I'm a five-year-old buck and I'm 140 and I walk up on a five-year-old buck and he's 180 and I'm sitting there looking at him like, geez, I mean, do you think that that, and, and I have a story which is kind of prompted my question and it was sort of about the territorial type thing. I'm curious to get your thoughts on that. And then I want to tell you this story of what I actually witnessed, uh, in the summertime that kind of prompted that question. The, the short answer to your question is yes. I'm not going to say intimidation, but I, I think there's sig- antlers are important for signals. Um, some of the research we've done at our deer research facility, our deer research facility was designed to examine mating systems and breeding systems of deer. Understand who's breeding, how, why, that sort of thing. Um, nobody, people really hadn't looked at it much, and, and there hasn't been much work done. Um, all things being equal, age, body size, and antler size, Body size is the most important factor. It is more important than antler size, but antler size is important, all things being equal, if you can control for it. Um, But body size is a little more important. With that being said, we know that antlers serve a certain role as a signal. They are a weapon. They're designed in each species of deer to lock with the other deer. They're not designed, I mean, they can puncture, but they're designed to be offensive and defensive at the same time. You know, I'm trying to get in there, but it's also designed to lock. You go take a look at caribou antlers. There's a reason there's a little part that comes off the backside, off the main beam. That's designed to stop something from sliding back down. They're designed in a certain way to kind of pushing and twisting and that sort of thing, to lock up. So they're designed as a weapon, but they're also designed for signals. And when they're signals, they're signals to competitors, but also potential mates. So they're serving both. The degree to which is a big question um, amongst ecologists. To what degree are they signals and what are they signaling? Um, I have a student that is going, that is currently examining the the, the degree to which her dissertation, a big part of that is trying to take a look at and tease apart this you know, weapons versus signal um, or versus ornament um, aspect. They play both roles, to do, but to what degree? Mm-hmm. I don't have the answers for you, mm-hmm. um, but I think that it's, it's some really interesting stuff. And, and I think there's a lot of truth to it that says, you know, something that big. And, and so I had a student number, quite a few years ago that looked at something that, that what about spread? You know, you can take the same size antlers and you can put them close together. It doesn't look very impressive. But if you lay those things out and give that deer a 24-inch spread as opposed to a 14-inch spread, it looks huge, even though there's the same amount of bone there. Mm-hmm. You know, how important is spread? So what the observation I made, and this was years back, and we deer in Atlanta eat on kudzu a lot. I'm, I'm sure you're familiar with kudzu. Yep, yep. They crush it. They, I mean, they'll live in this stuff in the summer. And so there was one area in particular, and this was – probably 2016 if i'm remembering right where we drew and i hunted a deer that was we called him charlie he was huge i mean just huge abnormally huge and we would watch him in this there was one kudzu patch here little road kudzu patch here and it's almost like this was the most desired kudzu patch and then like an a plus spot for deer and then this was maybe a b plus spot well there was this deer, Charlie, who kind of owned this, what I thought was the most desirable kudzu patch. Then there was another buck, which I called Bully, because he was, I mean, I just saw, he was ferocious. I saw this deer in full velvet lock up on another buck and, and just, I mean, antlers. And I heard it. And it but it was, it was right before they shed. It wasn't like it was, you know, July or something. Um, but even this, even during the season, like he was just ferocious, just a- almost angry at the world kind of deer. Um, he was probably 140 and Charlie was like 180s. So I would, I would go over there and watch these deer 
almost daily in this kudzu patch. And I saw him one time where... You're doing this daily. You, you had a tough dating life, don't you? <laughs> <laughs> well, it was every evening, you know. It was, uh, so th- there was one time where I observed that, that that bully buck and his bachelor group had crossed the road and come into this A-plus uh, kudzu patch that the buck Charlie lived in. And I'd seen this buck and how he acted around other deer and how aggressive he was. He was walking towards Charlie... And literally all Charlie did was he just kind of like saw him coming and just like almost just like flashed his rack at him and that deer stopped and then just like turned and started feeding back and kind of ended up going back across the road to the kudzu patch that he stayed in most of the time. Coincidence could hundred percent could have been, but to me it, it looked like that buck was looked up there and saw that rack and was just like, Dang, you're big this year. <laughs> yeah, he's like, I'm not messing with that dude. <laughs> Even though, and and Charlie was was a very timid deer. He was not aggressive. Um, he just had a, a normally, you know, large rack. Um, that's kind of why I was curious. Like, was that such an intimidation factor that almost Charlie didn't really have to be a super aggressive deer because people or deer just didn't really mess with him as much? But again, I you know we could get on so many rabbit holes speculating and about this, that, or the other, but there, there are some links and there's been some studies done. Um, I've been involved in some of them and, and, and others not involved uh, and, and not been involved in others, but, um, there's, there's a link between antler size and quality, quote unquote, quality of an individual quality, you know, being measured in a number of different ways. Um, and so, generally, you're going to find larger antlers on larger body deer. Um, those two things are going to be a deadly combination when it comes to aggressive interactions. Um, but there's also links to the genetic component of the immune system. Um, there's links. There's all sorts of things going on in there that, you know, we tend to think about, you know, deer. Well, it's a simple critter. It eats. It beds down. It looks for opportunities to breed. And there's a doe I'm going to breed with them. I think there's a lot of complexity going on there in terms of their ability to detect predators, hunters, potential mates, rivals, all those interactions that are affecting movements coming, you know, full circle back to, you know, the, the model by Spartan Forge. What the heck is making that deer move? Mm-hmm. That was that was kind of going to be my next question was, was there anything shocking to you when you first started digging into that GPS data, how, whenever that was, like that, that affected the deer movement the, the, it, oh, more so than anything is 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 the, the uh, there's your normal deer movement that everybody thinks you know that deer is you know it's going to be in this section you know it's here today it's going to be there tomorrow but the more you look at it the more you see that there's all these exceptions to the rule to me that's been the most amazing thing over the years that we see is all the exceptions to the rule um you know, I've got a student right now that's working on his his he he graduated a number of years ago. He's he's a biologist out in the state of Washington. We're trying to get his last data set published, and the the, the number of times that they go on these excursions. I mean, it's not there's some individuals that do it more, but it's not uncommon for them to leave their home range, bucks and does, for them to leave their home range. You know, whether it be for a mile, whether maybe it's three miles. Um, it's more common in the breeding season. Um, but they do it a lot more often than you realize. So as a hunter, well, I'm not seeing any deer on camera. So, I mean, I'd like to see them on camera. I'd like to have a little hope when you go out there, but you never know what you're going to see. Mm-hmm. And also, just because you're seeing him on camera doesn't mean he's going to be there. Um, but all these, there's all these diversity of factors and person. You know, I, I call them personalities in deer. Yeah. You know, I've, I've had the you know great fortune of. Yeah, I managed the deer pens at the University of Maine during my master's, and the deer would walk up to you. The differences in personalities of those deer, just like your dogs. You know, this one's a cuddler, this one, this dog's not. Well, these these deer, one would follow me around. Another one, you know, Mindy, she would sit there and jump, and she was squirrely, and another one would do this. And it's, it's, it's really, really weird. You know, when you get the opportunity, you guys spend a lot of time out there in the, 
in the woods looking at deer and you get to see some of these things but then when you get to look at it i get some intimate peaks kind of mm-hmm. get to peek behind the curtain with regards to the gps data or i did with you know at the deer pens to see these differences in personality you start to say yeah this this is a tough this is a tough critter to pattern and if i'm going after that one and i can put myself in that position successfully and do it i've done something pretty impressive for me that's too hard. I'm going to I'm going to I'm going to go out there and, and, and if it comes by say yeah. So if there were, I mean if you had to choose one factor to pay attention to as a hunter based on that data and just your experience personal experiences with deer what would you I'm going to pay attention to what I can do. I'm the one thing I can control. And I think that's the biggest mistake that we make. Um, you know, I, I, I talk to, I go through this with, with, you know, my graduate students with regards to trapping deer. And I even, talk to, I, I really kind of hammer it with our undergraduates during some of our field courses is you have to control everything that you can control. You can control where you sit as, as, as deer biologists, we can control where we set the trap. We can control the days we go there. We can control the bait as a hunter. You can control is your gun on? You control the day you sit. You control where you sit. You can control if you use a lure or that sort of thing. You can control your scent a little bit. I don't think we have any great power controlling our scent. But that's about all you can control. And you, we can. I think we can mess it up a lot. Sitting in the wrong spot on the wrong day. Boy, that's just going to be a good spot. You got the itch. It's like, I got to go. I got man, that wind was wrong for that, and you just ruined that spot for another week or two. Um, I, I think those things, you know, going out too much, the same pattern. You talked about 50 times coming in the, you know, from whatever direction, switch it up, one, you know, and the next time. I think examining ourselves is the easiest thing we can do, the easiest way that we can significantly improve what we do in our success rate and saying, how can I change this up? How can I change? How can I reduce the negative impacts that I have on deer? I think th- I think that's the biggest thing for me. I-, I just wanted to make a quick point, and I believe, uh, and I could be wrong, but I believe it was your some of your studies that I was looking at, where when I was controlling for um, uh, rain and humidity, that I would one of the things I assumed I've always assumed with deer is they didn't move in the rain. It was just like a thing I always assumed. And <clears throat> one of my things, and I, I make the joke, it's always like, for me, you know when you're excited when you're going to go pull an SD card or check on a camera that you've been letting soak for a year or something, you get super excited. I get the same feeling when I'm getting new GPS data. <laughs> so I'll sit there for like a, with a coffee at like 6 in the morning until like 10 a.m., 10.30 a.m., just like isolating for a few deer and looking at them. But then also doing like the meta-analysis of – for the people listening, you could think of it in the way that I'm I'm literally following around a deer with a tape measure. So I'm tracking how far a deer is moving in a particular day, during daylight hours, off daylight hours, those types of things. And it might not be your data, but I, I believe it was. That could yeah, be I wrong. Still keep, still keep coming back. This sounds like you're cheating on me. Yeah, right. There's studies. <laughs> other studies, are, right? Um, they were never as good as yours. Um, <laughs> Oh, I can't. I, and there's nothing better than 15 minute um, accuracy on the data, so it's as good as it gets. But um, uh, I f- would fi- I would try to look at the way um, the data was being rack and stacked, and and what features of weather um, predicted for movement, and especially in southeastern data. I, and this is not true in midwestern data, but in southeastern data, I found rain and humidity to be at the top of the list. Uh, rain especially if it was not like a down, torrential downpour if it was like a nice smat like just raining basically just something that you'd play football in with someone or but not, but not something where it's like a thunderstorm but if it's just like a light nice rain i would see more movement and then i of course you infer and you say well what's the reason it's like to do your like rain or have they been conditioned and nobody ever hunts in the rain so now they feel safe in the rain i, I don't know if that was your data or not i was 75 percent sure that it was but um, maybe that's something, uh, if you've seen that or studied that or looked at that. Um, again, I think the thing that's important for this discussion, maybe I should have phrased it from the beginning or, or set the context in that, 
when I'm looking at deer data, I'm looking at it with an extreme, with a very separate optic from the way that you're looking at deer data. So, you know, what I'm trying to draw out of it is what could be useful or pragmatic for the hunter, whereas you are looking at it for what is useful and pragmatic for posterity. So I think those, you know, those two things uh, should feed into it. But I, I would, have you seen anything with the rain or with humidity? Yeah, you know, and, and the data you were looking at, you know, it, it, the, the stuff we found is, you know, and, and you, you spoke with Jamie, you're communicating with Jamie, my graduate student, yep. Jamie Gallick. And, yep. You know, yep. he's, he's working on his PhD now at another university. And, you know, I remember it was a, it was a, and during his defense seminar, when he did his master's and he gave his defense seminar, we had a non biologist that was in the crowd that walked out and, you know, she looked at me and she says, Seems like deer like to move in the rain. That's one of the messages I got. And, and and that was that was one of the findings he had, you know, precipitation, at least to a degree, tended to increase the probability that they were moving. I found it consistent in Texas and Pennsylvania as well, just for people listening. I didn't find it to be consistent. Now, again, it could be I get new data from Pennsylvania and Texas in the future. Like, yeah. I always feel like I have to set the expectation. I could get new data, more robust data. You know, the data wasn't every 15 or 30 minutes. So I have to interpolate or I have to draw inference between movement points and say i think they were moving here because it went this far so some assumptions get made here but um and we could get more data but from where i sit right now if i'm in pennsylvania if i'm in georgia if i'm in alabama if i'm in texas uh louisiana these places if there's a light rain and i have the right wind i I think you have a couple things going and i'm again scoping this as the hunter but i think the first thing you have going is noise cover for your ingress and egress so moving in and coming out of the stand, I think it's much more difficult for a for a um, white-tailed deer to hear you getting into the stand and getting out of the stand. Um, secondly, I think most people don't hunt in the rain; would rather sit home and watch football. So you could be deer could be conditioned in that regard um, that they feel safer in the rain because they're not getting you know pursued in the rain or they're not encountering hunters in the woods in the rain. Whatever we haven't, it's like a dog. If you if you uh, ring a bell and feed a dog every time he hears the bell he expects food it could be the same thing with deer if every time it's raining he doesn't see humans or she doesn't see humans then they feel intrinsically safer in the rain um again i would love for you to um uh, uh speak to all of this but for from my points again i didn't see that in saskatchewan i didn't see that in manitoba data that i have i didn't see that in midwestern data but i really saw it it seemed to me to stand out the most in this region that we're in right now i'll, so. I'll tell you yeah in georgia we absolutely see deer move with the rain but you're right it's not heavy rain it's that kind of gloomy light rain and i killed one of my the bucks this past season in a gloomy light rain and he was nocturnal a lot but it was that weather that got him on his feet and ended up killing him in exactly the conditions you're talking about. We, and always, we would always see deer, if it was a heavy rain, right after that rain was gone, yes. boom, they're up. Yes, yes. And, and we, we saw it in Oklahoma, I see it everywhere. As soon as it rains over, they're, they're, they're up. up and moving. Yep. Um, and, you know, kind of, yeah, our data suggests that the deer are moving, you know, with precipitation. Now, we're getting locations every 15, 30 minutes. And let's go back to what our data said. Is we, if that deer was greater than, and, and don't quote me on the distance, but I think it was like 60 meters. 60 meters was the potential accuracy error that we were willing to accept. That once that deer was over like 60 meters or 56 meters or 48 meters, something like that away, we considered that deer to have moved. Yeah. Because there's a little little bit of accuracy in the GPS stuff. You're from more familiar with it than I am, just because of the stuff you've done. But at that point, we considered that deer active for that 30 minute period. It had moved. We did not factor in, and I don't not sure that that you guys in your basic model have looked at it this way. We're just saying whether or not that deer is active. That deer could be in the thickest cover known to man, but be active and moving slowly in there. May not be in a in a optimal hunting scenario. But it is active. Yeah. Um, and so, but yeah, I mean, they're moving. How do we use that as a hunter is another question. You know, the, some of the stuff we've looked at, you know, and some of the basic models is what are these deer doing, active versus inactive? Well, I'd rather be hunting an active deer than an inactive deer. So that's definitely a step up. You know, the next step in this. You know, and maybe it takes another 20 years of enough data to accumulate to be able to examine it. How are they moving? Yeah. Are they short little movements? Are they thick cover, little cover, you know, during these certain types of weather events? 
Yeah, to you know, be the, the Spartan Forge model ten years from now, you maybe. know, is, is, is going to be you know multi. You know, I'll be sorely disappointed oh, that man. you're going to cheat on me and not have a <laughs> multi-dimensional model. Um, you know, but multi-dimensional that you know is like this is a good time for this reason and this reason, not just because they're they're active, but because they're active and they're starting to move in areas in a manner that makes them more. You susceptible know, susceptible to 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 a hunter yeah yeah and so to to do my Sp- um, spartan forge cd businessman injection point here i'll do it very quickly even though i said i wasn't going to do it i often read the bow hunting um uh review like bow hunting uh what do you call them uh where people get together online the um what's that forums yeah forums is a good word i guess i was looking for a different word about spartan forge and you know just to see what people are saying. And I personally talk to people on Instagram. I, I'm always trying to interact with the customers to find out how they are. Um, if they're not taking me, if they're not drawing meaningful conclusions from the data, then it's useless what I'm doing. Right. So I want to, I'm monitoring these things. And one of the you know common things I'll get, I'll read is, well, I don't want an application telling me when I should hunt or when I shouldn't hunt. And to Steve's point earlier, my application doesn't tell you when you should hunt or not hunt. Uh, especially because the predictions across the one axis, we have the movement where it's like uh, core area, transition area, full range, which means, you know, during daylight hours, you can, exp- you know, deer will be moving in their core area. Doesn't, we're not telling them how often they're moving. It's just that's where they're going to be found during daylight hours, transition and full range. So if you know where deer are bedding in a particular area and you have a core area prediction, the, the app's not telling you you shouldn't hunt to the opposite. It's saying they're, they're going to be in where you think they're going to be during the daylight hours in this bedding area. So you should try to move into that area. This is not telling you whether or not you should hunt or not hunt. So to your point, um, I don't know. There's, there is not going to be an app, especially for individual deers that is going to be able to tell you this deer is going to be moving today or not moving today. It's just generally, here's what deer are going to be doing today. And then depending on if you've scouted or how you've scouted or what knowledge you have about the deer, then you apply that prediction for your individual instance. Um, and, and don't let an application or something else, if you have the day off to hunt, by all means, you should be out there hunting or scouting or doing something, learning, setting up that perfect circumstance that we talked about earlier, which is why we have all that peripheral data in the, in the app, you know, 30 years of weather data for you to go and look at. Um, that peripheral data is there so that you can construct that perfect day so that when the, everything, when the pieces are all put together, you can move in and, and make your, uh, you know, optimize your time. So, but to that point, um, that's, that's, that, that's the, that's the end, um, that we're trying to get towards, um, when we talk and, and talking about movement and these things, I think it's important to understand all of that. Um, especially because people, ev- the one thing everyone is short on these days is time. And, and so if you can optimize that time, you know, that's really what we're trying to get to. So, yeah, I think that's a good point is that like some people can look at this and be like, well, man, just go deer hunt. Like, you know, it's getting too scientific, but that is really your, your heart behind you doing this is, was less about, um, you know, killing big deer more about, I want to maximize people's time because time, you know, you have a family and kids like, and this guy's trying to choose which day of the week or which day he wants to go hunting. Like I want to help that guy have a great sit or kind of optimize his odds. Like it's, you know, you're wanting to help people be more successful, but you're not wanting to do it. And just like, uh, it's all about just killing a trophy buck kind of way, right. which I, which I really respected. It was, you know, you were, you're almost looking out for the people that, that are super limited on time. You want yeah. to help them the best you can. Yeah. Or more importantly, and I think most importantly to me is like, I grew up on venison. So if somebody's trying to put meat on the table mm-hmm. and they are working eight, 60 hours a week as a welder or whatever, and they don't have limited time to scout, then, you know, that's where I'm trying to provide them the best mapping, the best historical data, the best prediction, the best everything. So they can put it together and make a move and go out there and put meat on the table because, you know, there are still people that live. I grew up living that way and there's still a lot of people who do. So to me, that's the most important circumstance. Yeah. Um, uh, and everything else to me is peripheral fun nonetheless, but peripheral. Um, yeah. Hunting means a lot of different things to a lot of different people. Yeah. And, you know, to your point earlier, you know, it may not be the perfect conditions, but if you just want to go out and sit in the woods, just to sit in the woods and that's what brings you a little bit of a sense of peace, you know, go do it. So, 
Yeah, and, I, and I think that, you know, that's that's what it is at the end of the day. You know, yeah. I've talked to some of my colleagues and there's some times and we're talking, you know, at a conference and, you know, getting into the you know nuts and bolts of this that should I shoot this deer? Should we shoot that deer? What should we be recommending as scientists? It's like, I don't know. Does it put a smile on your face? Yeah, I think there's a couple there's there's a couple of things to this. And, you know, number one is I think all of us, you know, just don't not lose sight of the fact that we do this because we like it. Um, if it puts a smile on your face, go hunting. If it shooting that deer puts a smile on your face, shoot that deer. Just don't come back and say, gosh, dang it, I'm not seeing any deer. Well, you're sitting on the wrong days. And number two, don't say that, God, I never see any big ones because you've got a tendency to harvest a lot of four and six points. So understand that there, there's, there's a cost benefit here is all it is. If it's going to put a smile on your face, do it. By all means, mm-hmm. I agree, hundred percent. I, I <clears throat> and that's a lot of hunting today is like, oh, my neighbor shot this deer, or they shouldn't have shot it, or this person shot this deer, and they shouldn't have shot it. And you know, the the human side of me is, you know, if I saw a really big or a three year old that had a lot of potential, or a four year old that had a lot of potential, and someone shot him, being perfectly honest, the human side of me is like, damn, you know, I, I wish they hadn't shot that deer, but the bigger side of me is like that makes me happy that it made that person happy. That that's what is way more important than the selfishness I feel now of, I wish I'd have seen that deer another year. So I could have hunted them. But I think the only thing I do have a problem with is when someone shoots a young buck and they walk up on it and they're disappointed in it and they feel this remorse and they shouldn't have done it. And it's like a, that's not the, the, there is a sense of remor- or uh, of sadness out of respect for that animal, but I don't like it when someone shoots a buck just to shoot something with antlers and they walk up on it and they have that like they're disappointed in that deer. Yeah, and and I and I'm I'm okay with that because that to me shows a sign that I made a mistake and I won't make it the next time. The ones that I struggle with are the repeat they offenders. Cut, they cut the antlers off and just throw them in a corner in the garage and never look or or, yeah. or, or pitch them in that pile. Yeah, where I've you know I've always said, you know. Every buck that I've shot, and I've not shot many, yeah, um, is on the wall in some form or fashion mm-hmm. in the same room, yeah. Um, and you know, from the biggest to the smallest, and so you know, and, and you know, my, my father, we kind of have a reverse father son relationship when it comes to hunting. He started hunt, deer hunting after me, and now I'm a deer biologist, and so we kind of exchange information the opposite of normal father and son would. And I'm like, no, you need to, you need to. <laughs> you need to cut those antlers off that. And he's like, Steve, it was a mistake. I was like, well, you need to look closer then. <laughs> yeah. Uh, um, and, you know, <laughs> yeah. And, and he's, yeah. And then EVP puts it up with the rest of them. Yeah. Um, that's the part where it bothers me. It's like, in that case, shoot the dog. Shoot mm-hmm. the dog. Yeah. And, and, and it's, you know, the, 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 we I've, any hunter who's never made a mistake is is lying. Any any hunter, you know, we've all shot that one and said, I thought that deer was a little bit bigger, or I did this, or I did that, and and, and I'm okay with that. You know, at the end of the day, that's a part of it, but it's the one that just c- continues to pitch him in the corner of their garage. There's a pile of antlers there. It's like killing just to kill, almost. Yes. Yeah. Yes. And, and, yeah. And, and, but but at the the other side of that is that is their satisfaction, apparently. Mm-hmm. And I think the point I'm trying to make too is like I've passed on four-year-old bucks that have been 170 and to it's a 170 inch deer people would be like you're out of your mind to pass on 170 inch deer well i almost had to self-examine or look take a look at my own heart kind of for a second because i'm like i don't want to have that sense of i shouldn't have done this when i walk up on that deer so for me my personal choice was i'm gonna let that deer walk and i did and I just know that that's not the feeling I'm supposed to have when I walk up on an animal I've harvested is this sense of just like, shouldn't have done this. I'm disappointed. Someone ended up killing that same buck that I passed on later that year. Again, the human side of me initially disappointed, but it was that kid's largest buck to date. He was thrilled about it, over the moon about it. And that to me was amazing. And I'm really glad that I didn't shoot that deer so that he got to, even though there was a part of me that was disappointed that the deer was killed. So like, you know, it doesn't matter if you're hunting Atlanta or, you know, somewhere super rural, everybody's got neighbors and things like that. And so, um, that's just kind of what the point I was trying to make is that there should be a sense of like elation and 
but also out of respect, a sense of sorrow that you've yep. you've taken yep. a deer. But yep. Steve, will you pull that mic up to your mouth just a little bit? Yep. Sorry about that. A little bit higher um, up. Right there. Yep. Shifting gears. Um, you made a, a remark earlier, and I was curious at some point to backtrack to it. So I actually worked in college at a part-time job at a farm, uh, a high fence farm. And I got to interact with deer as well in a, a close environment and like these breeding facilities. And a lot of them you could walk up to depending on their demeanors and behaviors. But I actually, uh, was a guide at a high fence enclosure part-time in college. Um, it was 800 acres. And what I, you meant, you said something earlier about you've done studies on deer in, in a high fence as well. I'm curious to see what behavior changes you saw because what I'm, what I'm kind of, what I saw was there were deer that were super predictable, but then there were all, and I had, I, I had this place, I had cameras all over this, this fence, this high fence, all over this 800 acres. And I thought I had known every single deer that lived in there yet when the rut came around, I would find deer would emerge out of almost thin air. And I'd be like, I've never seen that deer before. Where in the world has he been hiding? Because I have not seen him on any of the cameras that I've got just scoured all over this place. Um, and so I'm curious to, to kind of just dig in a little bit on that. I don't want to dig too deep on the high fence stuff, but I'm curious just to see what behavior no, I, changes I'll, you I'll saw. Give you two things that, that, that we've le- learned in general is when we took a look at the spatial patterns of deer, they were extremely compressed. You know, we did ours in a, in a 640 acre um, high fence and where you normally have a deer outside of the breeding season that's occupying a, a buck that's occupying 400 acres these deer, because of the extreme high density, would be found in 100 acres. They would pretty much stay in a quarter of that high fence, 200 acres. So when you've got that extremely high density, you see a compressed home range outside of the breeding season. Um, and these and these are these are pretty standard patterns for home range that you know deer hunters should probably be aware of. Higher density, smaller home range. Poor as habitat quality goes down home range goes up. Habitat quality goes up, home range goes down. Um, larger home ranges during the during the breeding season. And what was, what was the fourth rule? Density, habitat quality. Um, getting too many years and too many beers behind me. <laughs> um, <clears throat> I did notice what you were saying about how their range shrinks because there was, you know. Sex, uh, males are larger than females. That was the fourth one. Okay. Uh, 800 acres is not that much for a deer to cover, Mm. but I did notice that it was like this field, only these certain bucks came to and they had their bedding and that's where they kind of came and fed and whatnot. And it was like, even just a field over those deer never, ever went to these, these other places. They, they kind of had their honed in areas and that's just what they did. We saw that inside that high fence, um, but we also see it in our deer research facility. Our deer research facility is 430 acres. We have about a hundred adults in it at any one time. It's designed to examine breeding systems and you know maybe someday we get to we get to talk about that um but it's you mentioned that you know you don't didn't get to see deer on camera we have deer that we don't see on camera we know they're there um but we can do a survey sometimes and we you know and four cameras in 400 acres that's one per 100 acres and or six cameras or whatever we're putting out at any one time and and over a week period we will not get a picture of Deer A, B, and C. That brings up another question: Is is that because their range is so small, or do they can they smell the cameras? Can they sense the cameras? I, I don't know why. Yeah, I'll answer that. Other than the fact that one of two things: either that they don't like corn as much, mm-hmm. or they're not using those feeders much, or they are more reserved and and, and they're more risk averse. Mm-hmm. Don't want don't want to be anywhere near that. You know, after you've been shot in the butt by a dart a couple of times, you might be sitting here saying, <laughs> you know, because we, we try and dart each deer each year. And um and maybe that maybe it's simply that. May, that may be the result of what we're seeing. Um, but I don't know. Yeah. Something that we started doing with our trail cams is just putting them as high as we can in trees and ang- 
angling, angling them downward so that the deer aren't just eye level with them. They can't just walk up and stick their nose in the camera. Because we've had, I mean, I've had several instances where I'm hunting an area that I've been hunting for a long time. I've got spots all over the place, cameras all over the place. And I pretty much know what deer are there. At least I think I know what deer are there. But then I get leads from multiple people, like four or five different people that are unrelated, unconnected of two giant bucks that keep being seen in this area. And I, like, I know two or three other guys that hunt the same area. They never, they've never seen the deer before, never gotten pictures of it. I have cameras everywhere, never gotten a picture of it. Never, never see them just riding around back there. So I'm, I'm asking myself, like, am I just getting messed with by a bunch of people or are these deer so smart that they can sense these cameras and know not to walk in front of them? From a purely objective perspective, the explanations are the deer don't like the bait. Mm -hmm. Number two, the deer are able to detect your disturbance and they're staying away from your disturbance. Number three is, you know, just off the top of my head, they're able to detect the cameras. Mm -hmm. If you stop and think about the cameras for a second, how do we build our cameras? To market them and make them viable by who? People. People. If I, w- if I went and stuck a pink camera on there in a box, would anybody buy it? No. Oh, they're going to see that in the woods. I don't know. Maybe pink's the best color to make a camera. Um, number one, what do what do t- do deer see? You know, it, it, well, it's camouflage, real good camouflage for a for a um, a tree. I don't know. Maybe or maybe not. That may that that may stand out to a deer. How about the little mm. reflective thing that's over the sensors? It's it's a little bit of a mirror. How do these things reflect reflect moonlight? Um, you know how do that you know in a bright light we take a look at these things in a store like the room we're sitting in right now they're 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 well lit well that's a totally different environment in terms of the type of light and the ambient light that's out there how do they fit in with a deer vision number one they are built for our vision number two what does a deer hear you don't hear a camera we're able to hear a click I was talking with a camera company said well our deer our cameras don't make sound really. There's batteries in there, there's moving parts, there's, there's all these different things. And what noises are being made that you and I can't detect that a deer can detect? You know, you ever have that with, I can hear something ringing. Well, the TV's on, even though the screen's black. There's something you can catch there. Mm-hmm. You know, are deer very sensitive to that sort of thing? Another thing that somebody brought up was, are they able to smell the camera? How about the the Pla- slow breakdown of the, the plastics or the batteries. And, and I'm, I'm not saying that the, any of those are true, but in reality, those are outside our ability to detect or what we're producing is very biased by, to our senses. What about cellular signal? So it's, it's, it's a good question. I, I don't know. I've never seen anybody do something with a cellular s- mm-hmm. I've never seen anybody look at it. We were so. talking about this on the way down here. Are you familiar with the hex suits? It be, essentially, it's it's camo or like a base layer that you put under your camo, and it's supposed to mask your electromagnetic field that you put off with your heart rate or something like that. And essentially, they're claiming that deer may be able to d- detect electromagnetic field like birds do. So, like if you have a if you're in a tree stand and you know you have killing on your mind and your heart rate's up and you're just it tense, they can detect that. So I don't I don't know if there's any research if it's possible to do research to I I but, I would believe it's possible to do yeah. research. Um but I don't have I'm not familiar with any information about it. I mean there's a lot of evidence. I mean we know birds are migrating based upon electromagnetic fields. We know that there's you know fish and sharks and they are able to detect electromagnetic fields in water. Mm-hmm. Um I've never seen any data that discusses how mammals are able to detect something like that or discussions of organs but we're learning new stuff every yeah. day i mean it's that it's that sixth sense that you always hear deer hunters mm-hmm. talk about like the conditions are perfect the deer is there somewhere but every time you sit he doesn't come in or you you visually see the deer the wind's in your face but he stops in the middle of that food plot before he's in shooting range kind of looks around realizes something's off something's turns around right. and leaves yeah. 
It's like, see, what the heck see, is I'm, happening? I'm a very lucky hunter. Um, <laughs> you know, my, my father will say it. It's just like, gosh dang it, you're just lucky. And, and, I, and I am. And maybe it's just they just sense this, this dude sucks. <laughs> um, no, there's I'll, not take much, my, I'll take yeah. my chances. <laughs> the risk <laughs> is <Scott>. low. <laughs> I've uh, I've listened to quite a few podcasts with Carl Miller and his team up at UGA, kind of talking about. I know they do a lot of studies on deer senses, smell, eyesight, hearing. Yep. Have you done much of that down here, or is that no? We haven't done anything. Um, it's it's the the majority of the work that's been done has been done by UGA by mm-hmm. Carl and 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 his his, his you know. Gino D'Angelo's taken his taken over for him at UGA and Gino had done some of that work. Okay. And but taking a look at vision, taking a look at olfaction, taking a look at composition of, you know, secretions from glands and then they've they've done a majority of that work. Not all of it, but mm-hmm. the majority of it to date. Yeah, I was going I know they've done a lot with uh, the sense of smell and you mentioned earlier that you don't you don't think we can really control our scent. Or we don't know that if that we poss- that we can control it enough to make a difference. Yeah, I I, I don't know. Um, I, you know, I know that it's the the, the scent industry's you know fairly large, um, and I know there's a lot of masking scents out there. I think that you know I do believe that 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 we can get rid of some of the odors out of our clothing with with the detergents that we use. And, you know, if I can reduce that odor that's out there, I think that's a positive. And maybe I can use a soap or a shampoo that doesn't have perfumes in it. Um, you know, I've always been of the, you know, people ask me, should I use it? I've always been of the mindset, if it gives you, con- I don't know how effective it is. And so I'm not, don't feel qualified to, you know, I'm a scientist. I try, tend to, I try and make my statements as an Auburn University representative on data. Um, I've never never seen data, so I try and be conservative mm-hmm. in what I say. But I've always felt that if it, if you use it and it makes you feel confident, then your probability of being successful as a hunter goes way up. You're paying better attention. Your attention to detail when you're going into the woods, when you're going through your at your motions of, of a normal hunt, then you are going to have better success. If you're sitting there saying, I'm not going to shoot anything today, you're not paying attention, you're not as conservative with your noises and your movements, and your probability of success goes down. See, those are the days that I do kill stuff. When I'm like, this sits going to be terrible, I don't even know why I'm sitting in this spot, I'm on my phone or something, all of a sudden you look down and the deer's there. So you try to, you try to play reverse psychology with the deer. Yeah, maybe, maybe. <laughs> Well, maybe you've just got this thing. You're just like a Neanderthal drooling all over when you're normally hunting and you're easily detectable. That's true. That's true. What other questions you got? There's so many of one them. Of the, one of the ones that I want to do is the uh, <clears throat> the CWD question. Do you think uh, yeah. that CWD is possible to transfer to humans and it causes a zombie apocalypse? <laughs> I think there's I think there's two questions in your one question. Is it possible to be transferred to humans, <laughs> no, no, or is just, it going to cause a zombie apocalypse? <laughs> we'll tackle it one by one. <laughs> I haven't seen any data that show that it's that's transferable to humans. Okay. I think we would have detected some if it had been transferred to humans. Um, and I've had this discussion with some colleagues over in a vet school that I'm just like, you know, there's no detection. They said, do you want to be that first one that it jumps in? Um, you know, it's been shown that prion diseases, specifically bovine spongiform encephalopathy, mad cow disease, could jump to humans. Um, maybe there becomes some very variant on this, and I'm not qualified to judge, but right now I feel very good that it's not jumping to humans. Uh, my hope is that that, you know, that statement is true for tens of decades to come. Um, and if that's true, um, I'm not quite worried about the zombie apocalypse. <laughs> so, okay. So you're saying, but we are saying if, if, if it could, then you might be worried. Then, then I, I would re- I would come back to that question and say, okay, <laughs> what is the result of mad? What is the result of CWD in humans? <laughs> I need to see some data. <laughs> it would be, it'd be a bad, bad deal if it, if it could transfer. It's, it, 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 it Yes, it'd be a very, very bad deal. And it'd be a bad, bad deal on multiple levels. Um, you know, I don't know if you're, you're probably aware, we just detected it here in Alabama um, a year ago, um, nine months ago, seven months ago. Um, and our, our state was very proactive in terms of monitoring. They were very proactive in terms of 
um, an action plan when it was detected. Um, it remains to be seen, you know, during this next year when they're collecting more samples, what the what the prevalence rate is and how far it expands. Um, there's some states that have done real well with their management of it. There's some states that have not done as well uh, with it. Um, fortunately, what we've seen is we haven't seen significant declines in hunter participation. Uh, there might be a slight dip at first, but it's going back up. Um, ultimately, the concern is, at least with management agencies, deer hunters don't think about this right now, but management agencies are state agencies. A lot of their funding that they get is from the federal government, from Pittman-Robertson dollars, which essentially is an excise tax on hunting on, on hunting equipment, guns, firearms, and archery equipment. And if you get a decline in, in license sales, the amount of money that's coming in for our, our these state management agencies declines precipitously and most of them do not get money from the general fund and so the ability to manage deer but also on the other side of this species of conservation concern non-game species threatened and endangered species goes way down so from a wildlife conservation perspective there's huge concerns about chronic wasting disease even if you're not a deer hunter so you know, let's cross our fingers and hope can that continues that way the problem is is general practices for management of chronic wasting disease in a perfect world, you're decreasing the age structure, and you're not getting five, six, seven-year-old year old, year old bucks. Um, it kind of goes against, in some ways, quality deer management and some of the practices that we've been, you know, have been ingrained in us in a, over the last 25, 30 years, and have enabled us to to have, you know, develop properties where we have high quality deer that we're hunting that that you know that drove that got you into this business. Mm-hmm. Um, it's going to it's going to be interesting to see during the next 10 years i'm thinking how well cwd management and qdm type management jive you know can they find common ground number 1 number 2 also can we get hunters to cooperate with state agencies and participate in chronic wasting disease management if those things are at odds you know are they going to participate in terms of supplying the heads for testing that's the that's that's where the surveillance is coming from and number two are they going to participate and say okay the state's recommending we do this from a deer harvest perspective i will participate so what is reducing the age class as as age goes up the probability of the deer having it goes up number one number two bucks tend to be much more social and greater distances and as a result greater transmissibility and it's going to spread quicker by bucks and so in a perfect world, in the theory suggests that if you can knock your population down, the probability of deer-to-deer contact goes down. So transmission rates go down, number one. Number two, if you knock down your age structure, you're reducing the probability that they have it. And if you knock back your buck density, if you went back to a 1 to 10 or a 1 to 5 from a 1 to 1 sex ratio, you're going to have much lower probability of transmission rates. So has the onset of CWD over the last, how many years has it been? The last decade that it's we've... It's cr- crossed the Mississippi and got found, detected in Wisconsin in like 90, 99, okay. I think was the year. So 20, 25 years. Is that primarily because of the incre- the population increase of deer? Or do you think it could be linked to the popularity of QDM management in an older age structure? I don't, I don't think it's I don't think it's a QDM thing. I think... I, personally believe it's a deer movement thing we are moving deer Mm. um i'm not saying that that is a when i say moving deer i'm using this in the broadest sense i think some of the original things is we were moving deer from breeding purposes but the other side of it is is the the popularity of deer hunting and going to kansas or going to wisconsin or going somewhere and shooting that deer is you can fly up there but heck i'm sitting here in alabama i can be in wisconsin at 12 hours i'm driving well i'm gonna i'm gonna I'm going to drive that deer back with me. Right. And, well, now I'm moving a carcass that's laden with it. I'm, I'm not doing anything, you know, well, it's against the rules now for me to be driving across state lines. But for a lot of years, we were doing that, and I'm just going to butcher it. Or I'm going to give it to my taxidermist or my butcher here. He's going to hang it, and he's going to dump it on the back 40. Did we just create a CWD hotspot and infect a herd? So there's a lot of questions like that, the things that we're, we don't know that that's happening, but that's a significant possibility, um, and we're learning those things. But I think it's a deer movement. There's also the question out there, is this a naturally occurring thing in the environment and sometimes just pops up, and we're just now detecting it because of testing? I don't mm-hmm. think that's so much the case, but I think we're moving animals, mm-hmm. dead or alive, mm-hmm. personally. Is there something that the average deer hunter whether 
whether they own property or not can be doing now to kind of help prevent the spread or is it on I, what? I, th- I think the biggest thing is what are the laws yeah. where you're hunting and in your state? And number two, recognizing that they're there for a reason. You know, I've, I've, heard, I've heard some state agency personnel say, we know this is an inconvenience for you. We know it's an inconvenience for you to drive here to Auburn to harvest a deer. You live in Atlanta. You want to drive it home. That's an inconvenience for you to have to bring it to a processor here and then come back and get the meat. Mm-hmm. But the inconvenience to those hunters in Atlanta, if you're going to bring CWD back, is far greater than this inconvenience to you. If we will just... There's a lot of folks don't like their state wildlife management agencies. They disagree with them for whatever reasons. They have their best interest in mind. They're trying to manage the resource responsibly. They're regular guys, regular men and women in these agencies trying to do the right thing, trying to satisfy a diverse array of customers that have different goals, just like all of our hunters, deer hunters have different goals, trying to satisfy all these different stakeholders and interest groups. And they're trying to do the right thing. They're not making their decisions based on money. They, they, got, they work for the state. They got a paycheck. They don't have to worry about it. They're trying to do the right thing. And if we just sit there and throw aside some of these petty arguments and opinions that we have and just say, yeah, this sucks, but uh, they are trying to do the right thing. Accept that and just I think that's the biggest thing. And if we can do that, then it's like, yeah, that's inconvenient for me not to be able to haul my deer back. Or, no, I can't use that deer pee from there over here. What are their rules? That's it, I think. Yeah, Yeah, it's it's difficult for me to drive. I don't want to drive that 10 miles and drop off my deer head there, my doe deer head, for them to test. But it, it makes a big difference. I think that's the biggest thing. Yeah. Yeah, no, I think just from an ethical standpoint, if you're in a CWD state, like, it's so important to follow those laws because the last thing you want to do is be responsible for transferring that back to your state. Yeah. I, I don't think people look at that deep enough. They Like you just said, they're just like, oh, it's just some petty law. But in reality, it, it could mean the entire deer herd in your state. <laughs> it, 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 it just takes one. Yeah. It just takes that one. Um, and it's just, it's not worth it. It's not worth it. You know, we have it here in Alabama. It, it, it's, it's up there in Lauderdale County. Um, maybe we found the two deer that it was in, and maybe there's no other deer. Does, is, does it seem like it's been contained so uh, far? We, we don't know. You yeah. know, it was detected in one deer. They found it in a second deer. I know there were two deer. Maybe we shot the two deer that were CWD positive, and there's never another one again. Let's cross our fingers and hope for that. Um, but I'm going to assume that there's more deer have it there. Hopefully they can contain it. Hopefully they, they, they make the right decisions and the hunters cooperate. That's The hunter is the tool. The hunter is the management tool when it comes to deer herds. Um, and so it's up to the hunter to, 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 to make the decisions that are that are going to positively affect that herd. Hopefully they do. Well, boys, we've covered a lot. Is yeah. there, is there uh... I think there's one thing that would be really important to kind of say before this is all done, and that's War Eagle. <laughs> no, oh, gosh. I'm with you. I thought you were going to say something serious. <laughs> That's the worst I ending you ever. Ask me a couple. Can I get the headphones yeah. here? I might just ask a couple. We had our users and some of our pro staff send some questions. I might just ask a couple here. So I'll say that again once the book is on. We had some users and some um, pro staff. And I'm going to quickly go through here and try to catch the high points um, on here to see. So I guess... This is, I think this was from my buddy Garrett here, but I'll say in context of research, or we actually kind of talked about this, case prediction technology, why is GPS better, better than, why is GPS data better than observational data? We kind of covered that. Um, well, the GPS data are not biased. Right. Observational data are incredibly biased. Yeah, I think I think I actually said that earlier, but um, um, we've actually covered a lot of these guys. You did a really good job here, Lee. You just ruined our perfect ending. No, I didn't ruin our perfect ending at all. <laughs> just kidding. We can, we can edit this. <laughs> um, what are your thoughts on regenerative farming practices for wildlife property management? What do you mean by regenerative? Um, well, I guess uh, 
what's the name of the farm? There's a place in South Georgia that does a lot of it with like a buffalo crimper uh, and like not planting monocrop food plots and stuff, just kind of letting natural. Natural forage, I suppose. I mean, to, be, to be honest with you, I'm not really familiar with it, um, but I think, you know, personally, I think when we start taking a look at food plots and, and habitat management is, you know, stuff that anything that we can do from a conservation that's that's going to be wise conservation, soil conservation wise, that sort of thing, that that's a little less intensive, but we can get good quality, you know, forage with it, I think is going to, you know, down the road is really where everything's going to be moving, you know, whether it be, you know, can we move away from herbicides? Herbicides are great, but can, can we accomplish the same thing with fire? You know, can can we plant food plots with, you know, less soil disturbance? You know, I, I, th I think that anything that we can do along those lines or start putting in crops that are going to be more um, native species as opposed to non-native species or get two seasons out of them or three seasons out of them at a, instead of, and I think we're going to start to see some of those things coming down the road. You know, some of your white clovers are a classic example. Get multiple seasons out of them. I have two really good ones here that we'll end on to get, so that Lee can be happy that we ended on a positive one. I think these are good questions. From a hurt, and I've heard this argued both ways by academics and others, um, and so I'm, I'm excited to hear your response here. From a herd health perspective and rec quality perspective, is there reasons to harvest dough early in the season or late in the season? I think you harvest doughs early in the season. I think, you, I think you're for, mo for two main reasons. Number one is, most importantly, if you knock down the number of does that you have on your property prior to the breeding season, right. um, then okay, you are gonna have a, you're going to have a more intense rut. Yeah, for sure. Your, 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 your males are going to have to search more. You're going to have more greater opportunity, number one. Number two is um, that's less food that they're consuming. Right, for sure. Yep. I yep. agree with that 100%. Yep. The only reason we tend to harvest those later in the year is, and this is an Atlanta specific kind of issue. The closest processor is like an hour away. And that time of year we're dealing with intense heat. So it's just, it's an ordeal. The idea, ideally we would like to take our deer, our does early. We end up, end up doing it later in the year because I think it's just better to do it later than to not do it at all. Yep. Um, but well, that's, and that's a problem we're trying to fix too. We're, we're actually in the process of trying to get a, a more, approximate uh processor open in atlanta where you don't have to drive an hour in a perfect world and it's not a perfect world right yep. yeah and i mean i think i don't from from an overall perspective i don't think it matters totally you know too much if you're doing it early season or late season i think you should just harvest does first of all i i think the context that we were talking about and i think where you where you hit the nail on the head is if you want a more competitive rut you have less does in the population come the rut. But beyond that, right, like you can go both and ways. And I think this becomes a very interesting conversation when you take a look at length of season. You know, here in Alabama, we have a, we have a gun season that's starting approximately, it's, it's, I guess it's the weekend before Thanksgiving. Um, so you're looking at, call it November 20th, and you've got a season that goes until February 10th. You have two and a half months of season, gun season. You go to some states and you've got a nine-day gun season. It, you're, you're, you're doing both at the same time. Yeah, and North Dakota. It, two weeks. It, yeah, it, it, it just it just depends. And so at the end of the day, a lot you got to do it when you can do it, but in a perfect world. Early. Early Earlier is better. Yep. Yep. Uh, last one, and I think it's fitting we end on this one. Oh, gosh. <laughs> Scat size and shape. Can it, indicate, <laughs> can it indicate deer size, age, sex, those things? I'm genuinely curious about this one. Because um, I, I, correct me if I'm wrong, I have always thought the myth was that a gloppy buck poop. But I've also seen 180 inch deer poop just pellets like normal deer. But I, and maybe I'm totally wrong, and this is just a me thing. But I always thought the common conception was gloppier the gl poop, like what is meant it? like clumped together. Yeah, it was like from a buck. Right. That's all. What I was. I remember being very young and being told that. Right. But me then too. I've only seen bucks. Like when I watch bucks in the field, pellets, pellets all the time. I, you know, I, I hate think it when that the, happens. I, I believe there was something to size of the pellet and size of the deer to a certain degree um you can there's some tiny pellets out there that you know are fawns yeah yeah and when you go look at an elk an elk's a lot bigger you take a look at a moose a moose is a lot bigger than that yeah. there so there is some correlation i'm not going to you know but in general i don't think there's going to be a huge difference in size between a, a buck and a doe i don't think what you're seeing with regards to 
as you use the term, gloppy. Um, <laughs> that is the it, scientific yes. term. <laughs> you know, it's just, it's just I'm a layman's <laughs> man. Um, I'm a simpleton. You, you said you, you graduated from the University of Alabama? <laughs> oh, God. Um, I'm taking cheap shots. <laughs> hey, how many national championships have you won? Oh, man. No, no, no. I, should, I shouldn't have done that. Um, but it, it, it's the moisture, I think, is going to be – it's going to be a more function of the quality of the forage. Um, you're going to have – when you've got high-quality forage, it's highly digestible – there's going to be less fiber in it, and as a result, you're going to have a softer, pro- more, probably more formed, or not, or not formed, but more clumped um, for um, feces. Um, when you start to get into times of the year where there's higher fiber contents, uh, lower quality forage, you're probably going to have more formed pellets. So is, I guess what I suspect. I, I guess one thing you could take from that to try to you know glom a lesson here for the hunter is if you're seeing more of that. Gloppy, is that what you call it? Gloppy. Gloppy throughout the year. Um, <laughs> way, way over my head. If you have that throughout the year or longer throughout the year, then you could assume that your deer have better access to better food. Is that, is like, I guess what I'm trying to do is for all the guys who go out there scouting, constantly looking at deer scat and trying to infer something from it, they could infer if you've got, you know, the, the soil quality, the forage quality is indicative you can, it can be measured Not, by that. I don't think necessarily because okay. I think you're going to have natural trends in terms of, you know, I'm going to go, you can go on the best quality proper, property here in the southeast. And you're going to, hey, when you get into August, and, and, and particularly early September, it's not good forage quality. It's woody. It's fibrous. The, yeah, the, the sure. plants that were coming out earlier are very green and succulent. They become much tougher and more fibrous later on. And so it could be good habitat and, and, and good quality for that time of the year. I think it's going to vary based okay. upon the time of the year. So and, and I haven't seen data. You know, I can't, you know, speak to it, but, you know, are they using food plots? Are there food plots available? Or, or sure. you know, is there supplemental feeding going on? How much corn are they eating? Corn's going to make it, you know, is is, is going to, you know, increase overall digestibility of a diet. Gotcha. Um, I just think it's going to vary. I think there's a, it's tough to interpret what's going on. Now, you can you can take those samples and, you know, you, you give them to, to somebody like me in, in a certain sort of study. There are things we can tell. I can tell you if it's buck or doe, if I get it in the lab. I can tell you the quality of their diet. There's a lot of things you can learn from it. But I think just field observations, it's very difficult. Okay, so it's just going to tell you there are deer in the area. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> very good. Well... I, I think uh, I'll pass it here, over here to Lee and see. Yeah, I uh, just well in closing, I wanted to thank both of y'all uh, because y'all, have, with your research and your models, y'all have created something really cool with Spartan Forge, and it. This and this is me being honest. Like it helped me kill a buck last year, and I used it as a tool that put me in the right position at the right time. That previously might not have been at the right position at the right time, and it was a core area prediction for that deer that put me in the right place at the right time last year. So I just want to thank y'all with what you're doing, what y'all have created and y'all's passions for this is inspiring. So, you know, appreciate that you guys, I'm glad that y'all connected way back when, even though yeah. Bill, I'm, I'm glad you're persistent and like a tick. Yeah, And thank you, uh, Steve. No, I really do appreciate it. Cause we've, it's, it's been a pleasure meeting you. We've been talking for a long time. I've known you since, you know, I was a squirrely CW four in the army coming back from Afghanistan a long time ago. And, uh, you know, I, I'll, uh, even though the initial response was, uh, it was great. I still have the email. I kept it to this day and I read it to myself every once in a while as I'm writing other academics and waiting for it. It's like, well, no one's really beat Stitchkoff's first response yet. So, <laughs> but yeah, thank you. And it is a pleasure to finally meet you in person after all these years. Cause I think we've probably got hundreds of hours, um, of talking back and forth and, I remember I was telling them earlier today, I, I, you know, 2016, 2017, I don't know, you probably don't remember it, but I remember picking your ears for about three hours about, should I do mock leaking branches on my property? Because there was CWD found down the road. And I was like, am I going to be spreading this stuff if I'm doing, because I, I throw up mock, I'm prolific with scrape hunting. And uh, I think I, you talked to me for about three or four hours about it on the phone one night. So we weren't doing a lot, but uh you know, it's uh, I, I thank you uh, for uh, placing a bet on us from the beginning because without you uh, and, and your faith in what I was trying to do with this company, the rest of it I don't think would have been possible. Yeah, well, so. like I said, I think it's neat stuff that you guys are doing, and you know, <clears throat> I hope it works out for you. Well, and, you. I, and I appreciate you guys. You know, enjoyed the conversation, enjoyed meeting you, and yeah, hopefully we can do it fun. again soon sometime. 
and I I know I went to Alabama, which is commonly referred to as the Harvard of the South. And I know that uh, you know this place is commonly called the armpit of the of America. But I do appreciate you having us down here. It's not as bad as most people say. So <laughs> thanks for these two the are time. gonna we're gonna get beers later, and then these two are gonna fight. <laughs> yeah, there's gonna be a fisticuffs. <laughs> Very All good. Right, we'll wrap it up. Thanks, thanks guys. guys. Thank, thank you.